what's up everybody welcome back to out of our league this is episode two uh we're doing things a bit different today we're making it more like a standard podcast rather than the one-on-one -on -one thing that way it hopefully flows better uh i'm gage i'll be your host today over actually down below this time we have al the predator tribesman to his mm. left i guess to your guys is right we have solid snake himself philip j woodward hello everybody on the very far right, yeah, the far right, we have Josh at JC Lego Man. First time on the show. And of course, in the middle, we have the uh, guest of honor today, the man himself, Nick Scarpino. What's up, Nick? Hey, guys. How are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. All right. Does anybody have anything they wanted to start off on, or should we just flow right into a community question? Did you, did you forget anyone? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, more I knew I was going to do that. Before I started recording, I'm like, I got to make sure I look over at the actual screen and see Ben. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you guys can't see the him. The man with no face, Ben, yeah. please be. There it is. He doesn't have the What's face up? cam on, so we didn't show him. I yes, thought, Ben is It's here. so funny. So we were talking earlier. It's, we were talking before we started the show. And I was like, how come your face cam's not on? And he goes, because basically I'm ashamed that I do this every weekend. And I have a, exactly. I have a real <laughs> job and a real life. And Ben, I'm going to tell you right now, give it up. Just give it up because you've got the taste. <laughs> For a better life, do you make more money in finance right now? Your cool real job, probably. Probably, probably you a little ever bit. make that much money doing it here? No, but here you can talk about your penis freely and openly, <laughs> and that's all that matters. This is a safe space, you know. Yeah, Ben, what's the name of your boss again? What's his phone number? I'll just call him up and tell him <laughs> we don't need. We'll just send him links to this I'll... podcast. I'm like, are you aware of what your employee is doing on a weekly basis? I'll, I'll give it to you after the show. That sounds Perfect. like a great idea. I'll take that. I'm sure that I'm sure we can we can work something out. Just like when when we hired Kevin or hired Kevin the first time, and he was like, I don't want anyone to know who I am or, or hear my voice. God, I'd fucking pay money to go back to that time period. <laughs> Man, that seems like so long ago. I don't even you guys remember that when we used to do it? When we used to do it out of, out of the spare bedroom. And Kevin was like, I don't want anyone to know because I don't want to jeopardize my burgeoning career as a as a syndication person at IGN. And I was like, just fucking. and he would like pantomime stuff like and we'd be like, we don't understand what you're saying. He's like, there's no audio. I'm like, well, fucking say there's no audio, Kevin. If there's no audio, then we don't have a podcast. He's like, well, I don't know what you want me to say. And I'm like, and I'm like, just speak up. And I swear to God, if I could go back and fucking pull, you know, like you guys ever want to go back in time and just pull myself aside and be like, don't tell him to speak up. Just let him be. Let him be silent and, and unheard, like like good children. You know, children should be seen but not heard. That should be Kevin. <laughs> Sorry, what are we talking about? Good stuff. <laughs> I figure at this point we don't have to do anything else. We'll just let Nick carry the show. Holy shit. Uh, here's a question I have for you guys. Here's a real question I have for Go you guys. For this, it. Is a real, this is a real thing. I need you guys to weigh in this because you guys are tied in with A, um, the youth, and B, our community. How much money should I spend on a PC to make... It has to be enough money to make Tim and Andy jealous, but oh, do I need uh, to get it? Should I get it? A, I'm sorry. The question is, we'll go around the group. Should I get a PC and how much money should I spend on the PC? Let's start with Gage. Um, if you just want a solid gaming PC, you can get one for around $1,300. Okay. So like around um, like thirteen to 1500 was I, was, kind of, I was thinking like 1500 realistically. Yeah. It was like my top. 15 is good. Like that's... I spent ugh, maybe like eighteen hundred on mine, and it's like it doesn't have the. I'm like a, a little bit behind on the graphics card. I have a twenty sixty super, so that's okay. Last not year's as good as everyone else's. No, it's still it's Just still yeah, it's still really good. Obviously, like going up against Andy with his well, fucking thirty eighty or whatever he's got. Yeah, you might want to go a bit more, but yeah, I'd say around fifteen hundred if you're going to be playing games on occasion. It's okay. That's mm -hmm. solid. Uh, hey, hey, Ben. Uh, let's let's just make Nick a little jealous. How much did you spend on your brand new PC that has a thirty eighty in it? Oh shit! <laughs> you uh, oh no. Do we need to just? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no. We asked that question because someone's in finance. Okay, here we go. <laughs> about, about probably the equivalent of around four thousand US dollars. Mm, that's a good amount. So thanks to how all much, my subs, uh, twitch.tv slash please be excited. Thank you. How so much, much was the? Uh, <laughs> how much was the just the graphics card alone in that? Oh, it's an RTX thirty eighty, so I think that's like fifteen hundred New Zealand dollars. Yes. Yeah, which that's what it is. yeah, about yeah, nine hundred here. Yeah, it's around nine hundred thousand yeah. dollars. So there's okay, so there's the thirty eighty, and then there's the thirty ninety, right? The thirty ninety yeah. is the 
Like, that's like the pinnacle because I'm seeing that at like two. Like yes. I'm seeing prices fed at like two grand. That's, just for the that's the card. new new Titan equivalent. So basically, that is a little more. Well, theoretically, if you look at the spec sheet, it's about twice as good as the 3080. Fuck yeah! That's and it's I like need. this I big. Two of them. <laughs> yeah, I need two of them. <laughs> Oh, I sent Andy a build yesterday. I don't know if you guys saw it on his yeah. He always fucking tweets these out like an asshole. But I sent him a build yesterday just to see if he'd catch it. And the build had three gaming monitors in it for $500. He's like, why is it so expensive? It's like, that monitor is dope. I was like, there's three of them. <laughs> the seat coming from all angles. Oh, my God. That's fantastic. I know. I know. It's, it's weird being a 40-year-old who's like desperately – like I don't want people to know – how much I want to get into Warzone. Like, I, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit how much fun it is to play with Andy and Stone Mike Mike and Kevin Ace X and all those guys, but it's so much fucking fun. And for the, for, and like, this is the, like, not to say that I want COVID to keep going, but there has been a fun byproduct of it, which is that I have gone back to my roots of like not being able to, when I was younger and had zero means and I couldn't do anything, my only real outlet for like, entertainment was playing games and playing games with friends and so now i've kind of gotten back to that and it's been fun to it's just been fun to kind of slide back into that and allow myself as a 40 year old adult married man to just fuck around and are we allowed to swear on this oh absolutely <laughs> fuck yeah just fuck around in Warzone and have fun and and try to get better at it and, and just notice that i'm getting a little you know what i mean it's just it's it's cool to be able to do that definitely well you're always invited to our Warzone parties well Ben's Excellent. Warzone parties. I don't play anymore because it tried to kill my PlayStation. That oh, did fun. your PlayStation do what mine does where it just takes off and flies away? No, yeah. mine actually went a step forward and actually started overheating whenever I played Modern Warfare. Yeah, yeah. Just... I don't understand why it's that specific game that does it to it. But literally the second I hover over <coughs> the icon for, for Modern Warfare on my uh, on the, uh, the media bar, it just, my, my <laughs> PlayStation's like, Am I, are, we, are we doing this? And yeah. it just starts going fucking. So I'm actually I'm excited to get my PS5 going. Um, I had a code that someone gave me for uh, the new Call of Duty for Black Ops Cold War. What's, what's, I, what's the code? What's the code? Uh, I, well, it doesn't matter because I think Kevin <laughs> used it already. Fucker. Nah. It, it went through our Slack and I was like, I, I put it in. I was like, dope, I got a code for this. I'm going to start playing and it's going to be great because Andy was playing on the stream yesterday. So I was like, oh, I'm jacked. I want to see what this looks like. Um, like not not on Twitch. And uh, I put it in and there was like, somebody already used this. And I hit up Kevin. I was like, did you use this fucking code? And he was like, no. And I was like, you used that code. Did you <laughs> Fuck mother. <laughs> what are you gonna do? I'm excited. Uh, that sounds like Kevin. Yeah. He would he would do that just to piss me off. He would, and he would never tell me. And then a year later he would bring it up on a podcast. And I was like, I knew you would use that code. <laughs> but hey. Yeah. I feel like it's that loud just for the immersion though. You know, you fire it up, your PS4 is overheating, it's making that loud jet engine sound. It's just to put you in the mood for the war zone, you know? Well, you know, it's it's different. It's so I'm in a different space now, physically. Like I, I moved apartments, and now I have a this whole room that can be my office. And what's great about it is it's it's four times the size of the little linen closet that I used to shoot out of. And so now, when things overheat, I can literally open the window, open a door, and it's not that big of a deal. But dude, when I was playing <laughs> in the old the old space, I would like you would I would be sweating from the toes up, and it was so fucking loud in that in that office i was just like it's, it's just kind of started to ruin the experience a little bit but then yeah. you, you know you get a kill and you're like whatever dude i'm, I'm a fucking man i can do this you gotta click those heads dude you know you gotta click heads you gotta click heads if you're not clicking heads what are you really doing you're exactly exactly standing still exactly that's a that's a perfect example. <laughs> so are you guys all wait going around the table are you guys all just like pc like what, what is your platform of choice as far as gaming is concerned i think we're all primarily playstation are you guys yeah yeah like i, I know have actually been considering getting a pc i did not buy a ps5 nick so interesting I've, I've been thinking about going pc and i know nothing about pcs and i've been asking the guys for advice i think so i so. think it's just like there's a part of me that just I used to love the idea of building PCs and I used to love the idea. Like I used to, I had a quite a few back in the day cause I moved away from console gaming. Cause I was like, Oh, they don't have all the good. They didn't have really like better first person shooters. And I just thought the consoles were better. I mean, I just thought PCs had a better experience, which they did, but yeah. it got very expensive. But now that I'm like, well, I have nothing else to do. The idea of tinkering around and trying to get the graphics card to work, all the things that Greg hates are starting to be very appealing to me. And it's not, it's, you know, no disrespect to the consoles. Cause I do think the consoles, 
are, you know, have a time and a place, but there's just something about like opening up the case and like putting more RAM in a PC that just speaks to me. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way now. Ever since I built mine, it's like, damn it, did I just change everything? Am I going to like yeah. go full PC gaming? And then I was booted it up and it's like, we have to update Windows. Now we have to update like, nope. NVIDIA graphics drivers. Now we have to nope. update Steam. I'm like, cool, <laughs> power down, boot up the PlayStation, yeah. I'm done. Yeah, exactly. Except, you know, you think you get away from it with PlayStation, but I literally, I just plugged in my, my PS5 and it had to update everything, even the controller firmware. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. I don't have anything to play on it anyway, so it doesn't matter. You have everything to play on it. That's what you say, but I've already played everything on it. So now I have to... You heard of your what, what, like, I don't know. You heard of your first, Nick. Uh, folks, Jesus Christ, I can't talk today. Nick has played everything on PlayStation I've 4. Played everything. I've played everything I've wanted to play on PlayStation 4. <laughs> And every time I play something that All I don't like, games. I have to keep that to myself because every time there's, I have hot takes on things like uh, the, the Spider-Man PS4 game. I was like, I got, I got about an hour and a half into it. I was like, <laughs> I don't like this game that much. It's kind of boring and it's overly, overly designed. And that was sacrilege. Apparently, <laughs> apparently I got excommunicated from the PlayStation family <laughs> because of that. Wait a second. So I have a question about this then. So sure. you're saying that you didn't like Spider-Man PS4, but you're, earlier we were talking uh, before the show, and you said that you were excited about Miles Morales. So I think it looks, it looks where dope. Where does that come in? It looks okay. really cool, and I want to give it another shot. But the problem I had with Spider-Man was the problem I have with a lot of these open-world games is there's just a lot of stupid busy work shit to do. Yeah. And I think it's – I just think it really kind of is – I don't want to say, well, I don't want to speak negatively of it, but I think it's poor game design. I think it takes away from the core of what the game is. And I think oftentimes they put those mechanics, they put those, those extra missions in there to pad it out to quote unquote add value. And I think there are some gamers that like it, but for me, I'm just like, this just gets in the way of the actual storytelling of the game. And if the storytelling of the game is not, not doesn't grip me, or if I lose connection with that, I just never want to go back to it. I don't care how good the mechanics are. Like that mechanics have to be freaking amazing to keep me going for 20 hours when they're like, you need to go get pigeons for 15 minutes. I'm not going to fucking get pigeons. I'm not going to get pigeons. Yeah. It's not going to happen. It's just dumb. And then people I, are like, well, you, don't, you don't have to do those missions. I'm like, yes, you do have to do those missions if you want to be badass by the end of the game. I really enjoyed. Uh, right uh, oh. oh, sorry. I have not no, finished go ahead. Go, go for it. first four yet. For that exact reason yeah i just got so sick of doing having to do these side missions and over and over again to get the i can't remember what it was the gold or whatever and i just thought no nah, fuck this i'm i'm sick of this yeah that was right there with you but i mean again to each their own if, if that if you like that if you like to grind if you like the feeling of really kind of like those those smaller accomplishments and games more power to you but i just need i don't have the attention span for that i need there to be constant stimulation to me for these entertainment platforms i don't like it when they start feeling like work if they start yeah. feeling like work, then I feel like I need to go do something that's going to be a productive and be actually make me money. And so if I'm if I'm if I'm feeling like I'm working when I'm trying to be entertained, that's that breaks my brain. And then I just go, I don't want any part of this product. I just want to go to something else. Yeah, that's when was the last time a game did not do that for you, Nick? I'm trying to feel what was the last game I played? It's been a minute. I think I think part of the reason why I'm drawn to like Warzone right now. Is because it feels like I'm getting, I'm accomplishing something because I'm learning and getting better at it. And pre previously, that was why I pushed, like, I was like, I don't know if I want to play a lot of these, like, these um, bigger online games, these competitive, like, online games, just because I feel like it's such a big time suck and you have to invest so much into it. But now I'm kind of, I've come kind of around to that idea of going, wait a minute, if I just, if I just play Warzone or if I just play games like that, like these, um, you know, just online competitive like games, I'll get better at them. And then I'll actually be able to like the time that I've invested in them. It's there's a switch that's flipped in my brain where I'm like that time actually, maybe I think that might be better spent than playing something that's just a little bit of a distraction, but there hasn't been a game I vibe with in a while. I'm trying to think of what, what the last game I played. I have to go. Oh, I guess the last one was two was, was a game that I played all the way through that I was just riveted by all, all 500 hours of that game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's something we've never actually talked about on any of our shows we kept saying oh we're gonna review it we're gonna we're gonna talk about it and then we never did and i'm kind of glad it right now it's phenomenal but <laughs> it should have ended it's like it's like <sighs> i was gonna get roasted for this it's like the dark knight where it's like three movies in one <laughs> and they're all great but they could have they didn't need all that in there and i think at a certain point you just go i'm 
I'm just beaten down emotionally by this game. I want it to end. I want to see these characters have some sort of resolution. It just keeps going. And you just, I know you're supposed to like take breaks, but that's not how my brain works. I want yeah. to get to the end of it. Cause I want to be, I want to stay in the moment. And I think that's why video games, I have such a hard time vibing with them because movies you sit, it's a very passive experience. The, the story comes to you. You're lulled by it. You're suspend, you suspend your disbelief with games. I've always wanted to do like, I'm sure people have done it out there. I'm not, I've never have a good idea, but, I always had a funny like I, I wanted to do a video where it's like comparing how if if movies were like games like a really hard game and so like if you're watching like the dark knight and it gets that scene where batman has to take down the swat guys and then he gets killed and you have to replay the scene over and over and over again that's what video games are like to me so imagine watching all those scenes that are these pivotal beautiful moments that all of the artistry and all of the writing and cinematography of music builds up to this one moment where he kicks the guy you know the first swat guy off the fucking roof and all of them go daisy chained into it and it's that beautiful music cue and then stop and replay the fucking scene 15 times that's what video games are to me sometimes with these, especially these cinematic experiences like The Last of Us, where you're like, holy shit, this is a great, mo oh, I just fucking died. Yeah. And then it's, you're right back into, oh, the music swells back up again. I'm like, well, I've already seen this. So it's already, you've already busted your nut like 15 minutes ago. And now I'm just beaten, beaten, trying to just get past this point. And so that's always been a little hard for me, but I know that's what yeah. a lot of people like about it. But for me, it's just, I think the true art, like when, when I think about art, everything has to come together to have that one beautiful moment. And if you're not good enough to beat that moment in that moment, then it just kind of takes away from the experience for me. Yeah, I definitely agree with the length thing. It was a little, uh, well, like kind of what you said about Spider-Man. There was a lot of padding to make the game feel longer. Like yeah. certain segments where it's like you have to- A lot of locked doors. That, uh, there was a segment where you're playing as Abby, where you're like running down like this neighborhood, this terraced neighborhood, and you're mm -hmm. jumping over the terraces and going through the buildings and stuff. It just keeps going and going mm -hmm. and going. I'm like, I've been running down this thing for five minutes and it still keeps going. I get it. It's to the point where Cutscene, like please. I, yeah, it's to the point where I was, and there's, a, you know, there's a moment in it and I'm sure people, I know people have talked about this before. There's a great moment in it where you're playing as Ellie and you walk into like this open environment. And I was like, oh, this is what this game's going to be. It's going to be a bunch of big open environments that you have to explore and traverse and go back and forth to get keys and all these things. But it wasn't. It ended up right after that just being very linear. Yeah. Which is fine. But after a certain point, I literally, Andy gave me a tip to turn on the accessibility options where you don't have to pick up everything. Yeah. And man, that made the game so much faster for me. And it, it kind of, it did take a little bit away from the exploration, but after 20 hours of fucking opening drawers slowly and your character stepping back and getting into place to open the drawer, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. I just want to click heads. Please let Snow Mike Mike be my friend so we can go play Warzone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> click a heads. Oh. All right. You see that joke? There you go. I didn't even Boom. think that, but yeah, I'll take, I'll take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> you should. That's a, that's a good yeah. one. <laughs> No, you know, I love a game that appreciates your time, right? Like, it just, I completely understand where you're coming from there, where it was, sometimes it's just jam packed full of side quests, and none of them are fun for the most part. This is the odd one that stands out, but yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah. Well, I, I know why they do it, right? And I, and I understand the economics of it, and I understand that when you're producing something, you have to go up against games like, you know, like Warzone or, or games that just basically have that repeatability for, for um, the end user. And if you're making, just a straight up narrative linear like single player campaign you have you feel the need to pack as much into that because there's there's value there's quote unquote perceived value in that right but to me i'd rather spend 60 dollars on a perfect 10 to 15 hour experience than 50 or like than a five dollar game that's just going to be 60 hours of trash or just useless stuff that's just a waste of my time um mm -hmm. it's just, you know i guess it's the same with with movies to a degree, but I mean, like, movies are just such a, such a lower impact as far as your time commitment that it doesn't, you know, you can watch a shitty movie like the, I'm not going to say it's shitty, but like, um, you know, <laughs> silly rom-coms that are Netflix produced with your wife on a Sunday and not feel like you really wasted your time. Cause you're like, that's an hour and a half. Who cares? But you know, when I'm, when I'm sitting there trying to figure out how to fucking make more arrow tips for, in, in, uh, for the <laughs> 25th hour in, in Last of Us, I'm just like, I want this to be over. Plus, it was super violent. And I'm not one to really weigh in on that the violence in video games debate as far as like, sorry, whether that, what, taking that out of that, sorry, I misspoke. How, how violent a video game is, at a certain point, I was like, God, this is wearing me down to see this level of brutality against this character that I vibed with. 
yeah. and I just had to take a break. But then when you have to take a break, you're like, I don't want to take a break because I'm in the fucking narrative and I'm, I'm in I'm in the zone right now. I'm feeling the emotions that I'm supposed to be that are supposed to be evoking f- through this gameplay. So it's always a balance. I get it. You know, I'll just go back to playing something simpler, I guess. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, that's a very good take on that. I do appreciate that. Um, let's break it up real quick. I want to get in to at least one. Uh, try to segment out each uh, question so we can go off of that and then continue to talk about whatever the hell we want. So the first one, this comes from uh, Bander SN at Joe's Beats on Twitter. Uh, this one is a bit, bit of a deeper one. Uh, does Nick see Kind of Funny's future as his end goal, aside from stand-up, or does mm. he think there could be something different in his future? Um... No, I do. Th- I do think kind of funny is the end goal, but I don't look at it in terms of end goal. I look at it as the like the way I look at the business is it is the foundation. It is the sort of center of the circle for all of my creative endeavors. It is the thing that is that allows me to have a base of operations and a network of people that can help support me. And so when I want to go do comedy or I want to go do other things, it it it's it's the thing that allows me to do that. So I don't see a future for myself where I'm where kind of funny is not in it. I think the goal right now, and I think the I think what you know Greg and Tim would ag- would would agree with is that we want to grow it in the right way. We want to grow it in a way that makes sense for um, for what we're trying to accomplish, which is just to sort of build a community, make great content, and have amazing you know employees that really enjoy what they're doing. And I think that once you do that, and we have done that to this point, it's just made this cool thing that now will just be sort of help sustain my my life and my creativity for the rest of it hopefully or until i mean that's always a question i ask myself too is i was like how long do you i'm, I'm 40 i'm older than everyone in the group but i just don't see myself retiring anytime oh, soon we know. and the question yeah thanks ben <laughs> or sorry gage but i was, I was thinking ben specifically because he's always the one that fucking rubs it in with the photoshop <laughs> yeah. um but yeah no i don't i don't see myself i don't I, yeah i think kind of funny's gonna be i'm gonna be kind of funny forever i just wonder like I wonder how long that is sometimes because you you do hit 40 and you go, when do I, do I, will people listen to me or listen to my old man takes at when I'm 50 or 55 or 60? Is that going, what's that going to look like? But if there's one thing I've known with the group is like, sometimes you just don't know what the future holds. You can't really predict it, but you just have to trust that the people around you are going to help support you and you're all going to just figure it out. So yeah, for sure. Kind of funny through and through. Plus, it's just so much more fun to be able to lean on the guys for to help me, you know, to help me figure shit out when it comes to like my other endeavors like comedy and stuff like that. It all builds into itself. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Writing coattails is something I'm very familiar with. It's the only way, only reason I'm able to do this show <laughs> is by writing coattails of everyone else here. Well, that's good. I, yeah, but you're in a good place. <laughs> I have a little background knowledge into certain operations of kind of funny because it, uh, as some know, Al commissioned a very famous predator piece from me, uh, which was then kind of purchased for a platinum tier reward uh, from or by kind of funny. So I kind of know how much of a background role you play in uh, the finances of mm-hmm. kind of funny. So would it not just fall apart if you disappeared? Um, Maybe. For sure, people would be like, (laughs) how do I get paid? Or did we file our taxes? So there's a lot of, I mean, I take care of a lot of that back-end infrastructure stuff, just mostly because I like it and because I'm a paranoid human being to begin with. So I'm always worried that the IRS is going to call us and be like, you didn't do something right, and now you're stuck in you know, six months worth of stupid paperwork that our government makes you do if you do something wrong. Um, but I, I I enjoy taking care of those aspects, much like I enjoyed producing content when Greg was on camera and I wasn't because there's just some part of me that likes creating the environment in which the creativity can thrive. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, it's like a, a fun pleasure and an honor to be able to make sure that people's healthcare policies are up to date and the taxes are paid and the business is going to continue to be, you know, a well, oh, I shouldn't say a well-oiled machine, a machine that moves down the road um, at, a, at, a, at a respectable pace. Um, I, I, I like doing that stuff. 
Um, I mean, I definitely could be better at doing it. And there's always a thought in my mind that as the company grows, like potentially bringing in an actual CFO, um, which we would not, and we're nowhere close to needing that right now. But like, if we were the size of Rooster Teeth, like I'm, I am envious. They have an accounting department with a CFO that actually runs their stuff. That's it's cool because I just don't have that real knowledge base. And I'm sure Ben, being in finance, can understand the difference between you know a person <laughs> who's like, I think I know what I'm doing versus like a, a person who majored in finance and works in that. So you know, better get but, that resume uh, ready, Ben. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> ben, in, in 25 years, we'll be ready. We'll be ready to hire a, a real CEO. Awesome. That'll be great. Yeah. One Sounds one good. more thing about the, the inside baseball. Um, the company name on the check that I received <laughs> was very different than kind of funny. Can you can you elaborate? <laughs> we yeah, we have a um, <laughs> <laughs> we we didn't pick the we didn't pick kind of funny before we had to start before we, we always okay so back in the day when we started doing the podcast and all that stuff you know you know we didn't i don't we didn't know anything we didn't know how to start a company before you start making money um so that you can have some level of of, of, a, of, a, of a, a tax identification so we started doing stuff and then if we, it was all on greg's private channel so we started making money so at a certain point i reached out to an accountant that we worked with and he was like well you guys should incorporate and so, but we didn't have the kind of funny name yet. So we just needed an, a name that could, um, that we could, you know, just kind of have in place. And we voted and came up with the most ridiculous name ever. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know if I should say whatever the corporate name is, but it's, it's not good. Um, and so I'm glad we didn't end up naming the company that, but that was a fun voting thing that I got out voted on. I wanted to call our company quality internet videos because I still think that'd be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we ended up calling it something else, which is ridiculous. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. I can imagine like the old school, uh, like early 2000s dial up sound effects when you go to the website. They're right. Like we wanted to spell it with a Z just to really confuse yeah. people. And then when you, when, when people call, like when you have to have conversations with bankers or insurance agencies or like Anthem Blue Cross healthcare representatives. <laughs> and they go, what does quality internet videos do? And you go, what don't we do? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so our corporate entity name is 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 a little bit different than our than our uh, current doing business as name. But those are just the things that you kind of figure out and you go with, right? Like if I've learned so much just setting up the business and and helping to run some of the finances and working with you know as we work with a, a small accounting team that's like a third party that. Just, I'm sure, face palms every time I email them anything. I'm just like, how do I do this? And they're just like, oh, God. But, you know, there's like, there's smaller things too. Like, I have to figure out sort of our relationship with places like the FCF, or excuse me, FCF now, not the FCFL, the Fan Controlled Football, not League. I think it's just called Fan Controlled Football now. And so, you know, when they, when they reach out and they want to have a business relationship with us, I'm the person that has to sort of reap those contracts and figure out what that relationship is going to look like and how it's going to look. And more often than not, I'll be honest with you guys, they go, here's how it's going to look. And I go, cool, because I don't have really a base of knowledge for anything, how to push back on that or any asks that we should be asking for. So unfortunately, we're learning a lot of, um, we're learning, <laughs> we're learning a lot of what not to do, but that's just kind of how it goes for the first ever, forever. <laughs> and then you eventually, when those situations come around again, you have a little bit more education about it. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting stuff to hear. The whole, you know, behind the scenes type of stuff. And we got some of that from Tim a couple of weeks ago, which was just awesome. Did he, tell, did he tell you our actual business, like our corporate name? No, he didn't I tell me like that. I feel like I want to tell you guys. No. I don't know why I'm being so coy about it. You can t so. If you want to tell us, you can tell us off the air. That <laughs> way it's not I, public knowledge. Oh, I, I didn't mention that, it because I, I didn't matter. know if it was... Why no, do I don't know if that is know. public knowledge or not, but I don't think it matters. I think. <laughs> Hold on. No, that doesn't matter. I was gonna Google it, but I'm sure people will Google it now. So our <laughs> yeah, our actual corporate name is Tickly Monster Inc. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so nice. yeah. So and I and I, I it's. It's funny because every time I write a check to to people, in, especially in the community, who are. I don't know that we ever tell people that. So I'm always wondering if people see that check and go, what the fuck is Tickly Monster Inc? 
And I'll be honest with you, there was a moment where I think it was me. Like, we, you know, we had to we had to get together and kind of discuss all these things. And so we we talked about that. We voted. I want a quality internet videos, um, but we got outvoted for Tickly Monster Inc., which was a Colin thing. So Colin, <laughs> a long time ago, I th- I forget how it came up, but he talked about how like he was there was like an image of the tickly monster, which was this weird, like um, East coast sort of like, I guess, I don't even, I fucking can't remember how it goes, but it's one of those weird Colin things that only, of course, only Colin would have known. And so he was like, the tickly monster was this sort of like thing that I guess maybe it was a story his mom told him or some shit when he was young. And so we, we voted and that became the thing. And then as it, as it went around, I was like, I kind of, and more and more, I'm like, I kind of like Tickly Monster. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> and I was pushing to have the actual company be named Tickly Monster. Um, but then Tim came up with kind of funny and it ended up going that way. And thank God it did because literally every call I have with anyone who is like a bank organization or they, they go, <laughs> what does Tickly Monster Incorporated do? And I'm like, well, we make videos. And they go, what kind of videos does Tickly Monster make? And I'm like, just, just normal. It sounds like the direct to DVD sequel to Monsters Inc. Yeah. But I thank you, because that's not my mind goes like some sort of taboo, like really obscure porn. Like really <laughs> weird. Like porn the I did not get that at all. <laughs> you didn't get that, you didn't get that at all? <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. So well, maybe I guess that's where my brain goes. I understand what it's like to be outvoted for a name that is now stuck with forever. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that go? Yeah. yeah. Why don't you tell me that uh, story? I won't, we won't tell the whole story of where we got our name from, but let's just say I, I was not and I'm still not happy with Sophie Sassy. Yeah, as <laughs> well, you know. I don't think most of us were. It was like, out of all 10 of us, I think like two people voted for it and then everybody else voted for their own names so we just by default had to go with simply sassy i mean i've told i've told the story multiple times at least tim has told the story multiple times we were walking around ign we were having one of those those very frustrating scary fun exciting moments where we were you know talking about the future of the business and naming conventions and things like that and we had just discovered that kind of funny.com was available to buy for a relatively reasonable price. I mean, at this point, we had made some money from the podcast, and, and I think we had some Patreon dollars coming through. So we were like, "Oh, um, we could, we can, you know, th- that's kind of the fun of making a business on the side." Where you're like, "Oh, we're starting to get some funds, so we can figure out how to strategize, how to grow it, and things like that." And kind of funny came up, and I was just like, "What a dumb name!" I'm like, "What a dumb fucking name!" And I'm like, I remember arguing with him. I was like, "There's no fucking way we're gonna name our company." Kind of funny. And eight years later, here we are. Everyone go to kindoffunny.com, you know, for a slash store for all of our merch. But I mean, I think that's that's just kind of the fun of and and some of the frustration of working with with other people is that you just have to sort of you have to make those concessions. But in doing that, you know, there can be some uh, really amazing things that happen. And that's one of the things that I really had to learn and and really have to practice over the last seven years is just not as putting my ego aside and saying, what is the best move for the company? And does this decision really matter? Like, does it really matter what our corporate entity is? The thing that's going to be quasi printed on our checks. And it's the thing that like, you know, we just file with the IRS. No, that doesn't matter. So it's not worth my energy to really give a shit about it. And if it's a silly name or if it brings a smile to people's faces, like that's all that really matters. And as far as, you know, so as far as simply sassy is concerned, I mean, I do, I, I would, if I were the IRS agent or, a banker i'd be like what does simply sassy do <laughs> and they'd be like well we make lingerie and i'd be like okay cool that makes sense <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah simply sassy started from an inside joke that is specifically a slut against me oh <laughs> i know yeah. a lot of those jokes that makes sense to me <laughs> yeah i'm still bummed we didn't go with our name our name was the best or my name was the best what was your name I really let's like go the, around the there. tribesmen <laughs> That that oh, was, the that was one that's of, a dope name. One of my suggestions. Yeah, my great. other suggestion was it's a little bit of a, a tangent. Uh, we were originally called the Biffle Boys. The Biffle Boys, like the, after Mike Biffle. Yep, after Mike Biffle. <laughs> I don't know if Why I feel. Not? I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> All because of one single tweet. Like that was it, where I tweeted something at him about like a game announcement or something, and I took a screenshot right. of the game announcement, and sent it to, uh, replied to his tweet. And in that screenshot, Phil had 
like replied in our dms or something so his, his name popped up and so mike just replied like after his initial reply like oh and tell phil i said hi i'm like oh that's funny so i put that in the chat and it was like this huge inside joke and i'm like fuck it we're the biffle boys now <laughs> just simple as that <laughs> I mean, just as far as marketability is concerned, Bithel, and don't, this is no disrespect to Mike Bithel because he's got a good following and it makes great games. Not as, not as broad stretching. Like I can see the tribesmen on like a t-shirt. Yeah, The Bithel man. boys maybe might start sounding like they're Trump supporters. I don't know. Like it, it's, <laughs> you know, like we keep making proud boy jokes and everyone keeps telling me to stop making those jokes, but uh, you know, I can understand. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, just know that our, our uh, what are the initials are unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. That's, Wait, we're not wrong, wrong there. The simply sassy simply initials. Sassy. We can't use those oh. initials anywhere. Well, you guys could do, you know, it'd be cool if you just did like the ass and the ass is like almost lightning bolts. That could be kind of cool. Right? <laughs> That's cool. Why don't you guys call yourself the Gestapo and just see what happens after that? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, that would go. That's, super a, that's well. why. That's why an A is our logo right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I noticed that. I was I was gonna ask you guys questions, but I mean, how far along are you guys? Do I mean whatever? It doesn't. And what, whatever. No. I mean, man. I mean, for Christ's sake, lose <laughs> your we... teeth. That makes no fucking sense. Yeah. <laughs> true. <laughs> it's got a good. We can still change on a on a dime, and I'm sure it'd be fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like I I. What, what were the others? So we got the tribesmen, which I think is a great idea. And that's a, that's a cool that that just is very cool. I mean, you might no, I think that's cool. We got simply sassy. We got the Biffle Boys, which we can all agree. Just thank God you didn't name your Terrible. Name. Yeah, terrible. What, name. Were, what were some of the other options that we have here? Well, literally, this oh, show was yeah. one of the rejected names out of our league. Oh, that's a great name. Yeah, exactly. So. That's the one I went for. <laughs> Man, you guys really dropped the ball on this. Y'all had to get together. You guys had to get together and do like the survivor thing where you guys have um, what alliances. You guys should have gotten together, boiled it down to just two ideas, and then gone head or three ideas and just gone head to head with it. Out of out of our league is a good. That's it. Out of our league. That's gonna be weird though because it's two, three O's and an L. Mm -hmm. Out of our. So that'll be ooh. Yeah, that's how I have yeah. it all abbreviated in like Streamlabs and stuff for this show. It's like every right. out of our league asset I have, I just have O O O L. It's yeah, not, not that's actually not bad. <laughs> well, it's, see, that's the, see, this is the thing. I, this is the thing we always you don't think about until you you form the company and you start making merch and then you hire a designer and they go a K and an F do not go together. And I go, sure they do. And then no matter what you do, a K and an F as an as an acronym. Just as a as a logo, KF just does not look good together. No matter how you try. To be it. fair though, it all led to KFAF, which is the dopest name for a show. That is a great name for a show. Yeah, that is that is. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm I'm. That was one of those things where we we sat there and talked, and I forget who came up with it. I feel like that came from the community or somebody came up with it. Um, <laughs> but the idea of naming a show kind of funny as fuck is, I thought was genius. I was like, this is great. And then we just we did 800 episodes of it, and now we're tired. But KFAF is is just a great, and also, and that, that makes sense too because the logo itself looks good too. So yeah, I don't know. It's way I better like it. than Pigeon Patrol as fuck or mouth Pigeon pudding. Patrol <laughs> mouth pudding. Obvious <laughs> obvious jokes, just thought starters. Um, revisionist history. I love them. Back. They're fantastic. I didn't. Well, we, well, we like tickle monster as fuck. What's that? Tickle Monster as fuck. Tickle Monster. Um, <laughs> <tickle monster. laughs> TMAF. Could you, like, here's my question for you guys. If we had ended up naming the company Tickly Monster. I would have never would you, started watching you guys. You don't think so? I probably would have, honestly. <laughs> yeah, you would. See, this is the question I have. Because it, 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 it's always a weird thing, right? Because obviously Kind of Funny is just, it, it rolls off the tongue. It's a good name. It's kindoffunny.com, all that stuff. KF, great. Um but it's it's a fairly generic name and i always i often wonder like what our corporate identity or company identity would be if we went with something a little bit more evocative like tickly monster because to me tickly monster i think is a great I, i've i've warmed to it over the years and now i think it's a great name and and by the way tickly monster incorporated is the the acronym is tmi which is fucking awesome nice. oh that is good that is really uh, good yeah, great brand I, isn't it I know. I, I we, well, you know, I, I've tried throughout the years, but people keep saying, "Nick, you can't just ask Andy to rebrand everything and not ask for a vote with everyone." But <laughs> no, I mean, I've, I, I love kind of funny. I love the brand, and I love, I love the brand. But it just it does 
you know, you make these choices and those, those, those choices do resonate and, or rather they echo throughout the years. And so, you know, recently when I've, we've done some shows, specifically stand-up comedy shows, it begs the question, do you put kind of funny presents or a kind of funny comedy show on a stand-up show, right? The, the branding of that is confusing for people. Are you telling me that this show is only going to be mildly funny if I go to it because it's a kind of funny show? And then, of course, I didn't know anything about this because I didn't start doing stand-up comedy until well into the, the company's um, uh, the company being a company and me, me helping to run it. But there's also another group in San Francisco called Hella Funny. And they were like, wait a minute, you're kind of funny. And I'm like, wait, you're hella funny. So this is confusing for people. And they were like, are you, did you, are you screwing with us? And I was like, no, no, no. I've had this brand for five years and we make money on podcasts and it's my full-time job. But there's just a lot of things that like, there's no real brand that's like one size fits all, obviously. But I mean, God forbid if someone said, hey, we're going to name our company Rooster Teeth. I'd be like, that's the dumbest fucking name I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and obviously they're thriving right now or, well, at least they were. I don't know what they're doing now, but I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're plugging along. Of course, you could always be IGN, which stands for absolutely nothing anymore. Um, yeah. So I don't mean that like philosophically. I mean that like literally. It just doesn't have a name. It just is IGN. So yeah, didn't they like abandon the Imagine Games Network or whatever? Like when whoever bought them like ten years ago or something. Yeah, like that? when they well they spread they were sold. They started as Imagine Games Network online uh, component, and then they were sold off. And so they were they kept the IGN name, but they were no longer part of the Imagine Network, <laughs> which I think is not around anymore i'm not quite sure that got turned into something else and then fox bought them and then they were just ign which was a fox news core property and now they're owned by someone else so it's just silly stuff like that but yeah yeah there's a lot of really think about it. all the names for all the big companies out there are kind of stupid like ubisoft well ubisoft well, is it, thing is I, they stand for stuff but like if you actually think about well, Square Enix the became name. it became a name because the two companies yeah. merged. Squaresoft. Square, Squaresoft was awesome. That's that to me is an awesome name. Ubisoft is cool because I think it stands for ubiquitous software, right? Yeah. Which is kind yeah. of a generic name, but when you when you plug it together, see to me, I love names that have depth, and that was one of the reasons why I kind of like revolted against kind of funny because I was like, it's so on the nose. There's no, there's no extraness to it. There's no added depth to it that that tells people, hey, we're sort of self aware. And then, but Tim argued the opposite where he's like, well, I think we are self-aware because if we're calling ourselves kind of funny or we're saying it like, hey, that's kind of funny. That's a thing that people say all the time. Are we not just then letting people know that we're making that level of content? And I was like, I don't know. To me, I always wanted the name that's going to like, that's just clever. I always wanted a clever name and it doesn't really matter necessarily because at the end of the day, who gives a shit if Rooster Teeth's making, if it's the Rooster Teeth podcast, as long as it's fun and as long as the it's the personalities that you that you vibe with and as long as the 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 name is memorable, that's all that really matters. And man, how many times a day do you say it's kind of funny because this, that, or the other thing? So all it's the there. Time. All yeah, the it's time. there, right? Um, and so that's a common parlance, obviously. And so when we adopted that, I was like, okay, well, this is going to do it. But then there's so there's so much part of it that's like, what comes first? It's like a chicken or an egg thing. When you have a brand name and that becomes a brand identity, do you then start making content based around that? How does that influence the content you make, right? If your name, like, I don't know if you guys know the, the story behind Rooster Teeth, but the original name they wanted to go with was Cockbite. And <laughs> I think their lawyer said, or someone came around and said, you guys can't name your company Cockbite because it's not... Like that's not going to be good. That's not marketable. You can't put cock bite on a t-shirt and sell it in a target. And so someone said, well, how about just rooster teeth? And then they were like, cool. And then they were like, how do we make a logo that's rooster teeth? And then it's just rooster and teeth, which is no disrespect to their logo, but it's not, it does. Those two things don't go so well together that there's like a, a synergetic energy that makes it more than the sum of their parts. Yeah. So I, I just wonder, I'm like, if we were called tickly monster incorporated, would that dictate I think more of a comedy to me it would be like, okay, well, if I was going to a site that's called Tickly Monster, right? I would assume those guys are making fucking crazy comedy videos. If it's a group of dudes with beards who are in their forties, we're going to see some crazy shit come out of that. Right. Yeah. But then does that bode well for the journalism side of what we do, which I would argue is probably a solid 70 to 75% of our game right now, specific on the game side and kind of funny games to me is really strong. I think that that as a brand is, for some reason in my brain, I'm like, that really works really well. Like KFG, the logo looks good together. They're like kind of funny games, like you're playing fun games, things like that. That's cool to me. Um, so I don't know. I'm always kind of, I'm always kind of reiterating or like looking at these things and reexamining them. But 
I think ultimately I pay too much, way too much mind to them because it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But Tribesman is dope. Right? <laughs> can you re-examine our runner-up? Which was? A uh, name that will almost beat Simply Sassy was What Happened? That so, was, <laughs> what happened? That, it yeah. was what happened. <laughs> that almost beat Simply Sassy. That's not good. That is not good. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll tell you why. That's because it, because there, anytime that you have to have a logo, this is, a, I don't know if you guys know the hard set rule in, in Hollywood, but there's a curse for any title that has <laughs> a question mark in it. Are you guys familiar with that? No, no. Yeah, that was an old school, no. like, that was sort of like an old school wives tale that people would say. So, there, so when I studied screenwriting, one of the things that was going around, they were like, don't make a title that's a question because every movie that's ever come out with a question or whatever tanks in the box office. And I'm sure that's all anecdotal evidence. I'm sure it's just because those movies, like, what about Bob was not exactly the most marketable fucking movie ever. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but like, look, but, you know, I think that's like, one of the reasons why like look who's talking wasn't who was talking it's look who's talking like so they were like those so it's just there's some weird thing i could be misremembering this obviously but like counterpoint i'm not though, a huge dude yes. where's my car not Ooh. the most <laughs> successful cinematic venture for both uh sean william scott and aston kutcher but i hold that as one of my top 10 all-time favorite comedies not best comedies just favorite comedies and I've been wanting to go back and watch that again so so much. But, you know, I think as far as you guys are concerned, I mean, look, Simply Sassy is great. SSs do go together, but you just can't. You got to make sure it just doesn't look like you're you're going to go out there and put people on concentration camps. I mean, we're a bunch of white dudes, and a couple of us have blonde hair, so it doesn't look good. Yeah, you got to be careful with that. Yeah. You do have to be careful <laughs> with that. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that, I don't know. At the end of the day, the content is what really matters, and, and, and the community you're – you know, you're, you're creating around that content and, and the vibe that you guys are cultivating is really all that matters. So, you know, Definitely. take that for what it's worth because a brand is only so, as strong as the people that help make it. So that's what I've learned. Yeah. So we're luckily doing okay, I guess. Hopefully we'll, well how is it? So how's it going for you guys? So you guys are doing this on a weekly basis? <laughs> we try to do it. Well, we have three shows technically, but we only do the Photoshop challenge weekly just because that's right. what everybody lines up on and that's our best performing content overall aside from is that this. what do you, is that show called just photoshop challenge oh it's the literally on youtube no. the not kfaf photoshop challenge so just call it the photoshop challenge <laughs> that's great that's great i mean that's that's the thing i've learned too i mean like you obviously guys you know sitting here you guys are like the all-stars of the photoshop challenges throughout the years and obviously provided me with personally just a tremendous amount of laughs and maybe just a little bit of anger but that's okay because that's <laughs> Those two are close. They're kissing cousins, you know, laughter and rage. Um, but yeah, so you've got that show. You've got this show, which is out of our league. And yeah. then what else do you have? And we have the SAS cast, which is just our standard podcast, basically, that we cool. haven't done in like 10 weeks because of the Photoshop challenge and now this show. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 the issue. But I mean, that, that was that was one of the issues we, you know, I think that was the hardest part of forming the company originally was that we had... We had so many different things that we wanted, that we did. We had different <laughs> products. We had a conversation with Colin. We started the podcast. Uh, we had Oreo Oration. And thankfully, those were things that we could, like conversation with Colin specifically, we could film like 10 of them in a day. Yeah. And then easily, like we were, I think I was editing two different cameras in that at, at a certain point. But at a certain point, you have to make those concessions. And I think the most important thing is to just get them out regularly and keep doing it. And so if it's a matter of like all 10 of us have to be a part of this podcast or you know what, we're just gonna do four, four, and four for the three different products or whatever. I think that's 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 a concession that you guys should be willing to make. Um, as far as I'm concerned, because I think the pod doing the podcast every week, I think was the thing that really, really gelled us as a group and also told everyone in the group, hey, we're committed to this. And it was hard. Like it was there was moments where I'm like, I do not want to fucking go to Colin and Greg's house right now. At I mean, we'd get out of work. We'd have to be, we'd all get in my Honda. Whenever the last person was done working, it was always fucking Greg. It was always Greg. Guys, like I need five more minutes. I'm like, Greg, it's fucking seven o'clock right now. I'm on my 50th cigarette of the day. I just want to get, order some some really cold, bad, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> Mexican food and go and knock this thing out. But of course, I still have to go over and set the lights up and get to make sure all this stuff. You know, this is when I was running the board and stuff like that too. And so, but those were like the, those were the times that really gelled us as a group and really kind of told everyone as, you know, Hey, we're going to do this thing. This is something we're going to do. And that was what's our, what was cool about 
you know, when I look at some of my friends who run their companies solo, I'm like, I don't know how you do it. Cause there was a moment every third week where I was like, I don't want to do this shit anymore. But Tim would be like, oh, come on, let's go do it. Or Colin would say something funny or, you know, to, to, or, or Greg would, you know, fall asleep in the car. We'd all make fun of him or whatever. And that, those would be the moments that like, I'd rely on the guys to get me through, to give me a little bit of extra encouragement or inspiration or just energy that I just didn't have that week to, to, to make this thing a thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Cause that, that's the biggest. Honestly, in my opinion, go ahead, Josh. Sorry, Gage. No, go for it. Honestly, in my opinion, I, I think it, it is easier for someone to do it on their own than, than a whole group <clears throat> together. Um, I don't know if I've actually said this on any of our shows or anything, but Josh I used to have I hate everyone. <laughs> 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 I, do, I don't know if I've said this, but I fucking hate Gage. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry, continue, Josh. I used to have a, a YouTube channel with a group of my friends from school, and it was like, the most difficult thing to get together and actually record things. Yeah. Even especially after school, because then it was work in university and we were like recording shit at midnight on a Saturday. And, and eventually when that kind of broke down, one of us has been off doing his own thing and he's like, well, successful in our eyes. Um, and just doing things on his own. Cause so I, I mean, it, yeah. For getting together. And, and doing things and having all having the same energy to actually do something at once. So I think you, I think that that's the balance, right? If you're the kind of person that's super self motivated and you just want it to be your way or the highway, and you have your vision and you you think you can do it repetitively over, like you can repeat that creative process over and over and over again, then absolutely do it on your own. I'm not that person. I love nothing more than putting all my creative efforts into a stupid halloween prank call video that took me way too fucking long to edit and way too long to like bounce i i gave andy the audio five times and i was like how's this sound he's like it doesn't sound good enough it's not like a phone call i was like god damn it, i'll go back to it and then finally he did it for me if you're the but like i like to do that and then go cool i'm gonna rest for a couple weeks and we're gonna just do the podcast and have fun on that and then come back and refill those creative tanks but i'm fortunate that i have other people like andy or tim or greg or, or you know everyone that i work with who can pick up the slack for me when I'm tired, when I've spent way too much, way too much time on a project like that. But you have to make those concessions as well, right? You have to be okay with the, like if your level of quality, if the level of quality that you want to hit is hundred percent, you have to be okay with 75%. You have to be, if you're working with other people you, and that, and that's something that I had to learn, like coming from being the lead producer on a lot of our stuff at IGN, where I would be like, this is the way it's going to be. And people are like, well, I don't like that. And I'd be like, well, I'll go fuck yourself. Cause I'm your boss and you have to. Versus now, like when you run a small company, you can't you can't have that attitude. You have to be like, well, you're gonna do it that way. I want it done this way, but it's your job to do it, so you just go do it. And as long as the end result is this is similar to what we want, then that's all that matters. And so I think running your own company, doing all your stuff, is a a great way to do it in the short term. But if you want long term, if you want longevity, I think having a, a productive partnership where people can, can you where you can lean on people when you are tired, I think that if you can cultivate that, then I think ultimately that's the better way to go. And yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Unless, unless Philip's a part of it, in which case <laughs> cut out that cancer. If you know what I mean, <laughs> he's frozen. I can't tell if you heard that or not. Okay. He's oh fine. no, I, okay. I can absolutely hear. Okay, cool. 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 Sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's basically why the Photoshop challenge is the main thing right now. Cause it's something we know is, popular enough there's enough kind of funny best friends out there that love the photoshop challenge that will yeah. tune in every week and absolutely like everybody being worldwide like a few of us are here in the states but we're kind of spread out like uh, phil and i are on the west coast but then matt's in the midwest mm -hmm. you've got josh in south africa you've got ben and uh one of our other guys carl in new zealand you've got somebody in sweden london like or england there's people everywhere wait who's who's from sweden uh, Robin GL. It's one. Robin. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't know Robin. Robin was a part of this. Robin's fucking president or king of Sweden. <laughs> the king of Sweden. Photoshops are my <laughs> favorite. And this is no disrespect to you guys because you guys have had each amazing stuff that you've turned in. But those, that for some reason, that gets me every single time. I don't know. That's her good. That's her good. They're so good. We, we recently did a uh, Halloween King where trying to see who the community thought was the true Halloween King, whether it was blessing or whether it was Greg. And so we just had them do a bunch of fun photoshops for that. But I loved Robin's submission. It was just like 
the uh, king of Sweden with like an orange filter over him. Yeah, it was perfect. <laughs> It was perfect. <laughs> that guy's the best, man. That guy's the best. He wanted to be here today, but he had to work later. So if he gets off in time, he might be able to drop in for cool. the tail end of the show. So fingers That's crossed great. for him. Uh, let's kick it over to anybody else here. Al, did you have anything you wanted to bring to the table for a topic or a question for Nick? Um, I wanted to ask, how do you? How did? You, how was it going into uh, stand up and being sort of? Uh, a latecomer how did you deal mm -hmm. with that and how how did you overcome that um it's tough and it's still something that i'm working on because honestly i feel very displaced from the scene um it's one of those things where as you go through your life you start to see your friend groups sort of go in different directions right and so when you're in your 20s everything seems great because everyone's sort of in that same place in life. Nobody's married quite yet. Everyone's sort of figure out what their career is. And there's just so much fun that can be had when you're trying to do something like stand up when you're early twenties, cause nothing matters, right? You can go burn it out till two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning, smoke cigarettes and everyone's sort of on the same page. <laughs> you hit 30 and your friends start splitting up into like two different groups, the, the small or, or the large margin of people who are then going to start having kids and buying houses. And like, then they sort of become, sort of like, I don't want to say slaves to their job, but their job becomes incredibly important and they can't take those risks anymore. And then you have people like me who I'm like, I'm not having kids. Um, and I, ha I do run this other company. I don't necessarily live this traditional life like a lot of my friends do where they work for corporations and things like that. And so when I go, when I came back to, to start doing stand-up comedy, it was weird because I was stepping back into that 22-year-old world, but with but I'd already been there. I'd already done that. And so I feel it's it's hard for me to connect a lot with with most of the comics because a lot of them are really young. Um, and I also sometimes feel, specifically when I go to Punchline, that I'm just, it's like going back to high school, but I'm not accepted. And the only thing that's my, my only solace with that is that every comic I talk to feels the same way about Punchline for some reason because it's just, it's that kind of place where it's so intimidating that you just feel like you, people are judging you in any given second. But it's it's strange because like I'm I'm running a new show um, at the end of November in San Francisco. So if anyone's here and you guys want to go to it, I think it's the 27th, the 28th. If you go to redandwhite.com/comedy on the bay, we're doing a, a socially distant show on the top of a uh, a boat in the middle of the bay. And so, but the guy I'm helping run that with is 27. He's in that part of his life where he's just figuring some stuff out and really kind of getting his feet underneath him as far as like growing as a stand up and making it into his business. And so it's kind of cool to see that, but it, it puts me in a weird place because. I'm 40, I run this business. And I would say that as as far as like the Nick it kind of funny, we got our shit kind of figured out. But the Nick and comedy, I'm just, I still feel like I'm waiting in the middle of the bay, no no pun intended, just trying to figure out which direction to go in. Because I'm three years into that, but I'm 20 years into my online media production career. So it's it's just, there's just a weird level of parody that's not there. But what's cool about that is when I go into that, I feel like I'm learning new shit again and I'm scared and I'm like, I don't know what the hell's going on. And I, I, it feels like you feel like you should feel where you're like, I'm more excited than scared. Like I'm like Owen Wilson from that beginning of like Armageddon where he's like, this wow. is, I'm excited. wow, this is the scariest <laughs> environment imaginable. That's all you had to say. Um, but so it's, it's, it's been odd. It's been an odd transition. And I wish I had started doing it when I was younger, but I don't know. Because I think also when you're younger, you, you don't realize how much you have to lose. So you can go out and make ridiculous jokes and say stupid shit that you don't realize should you should not be letting people record until it's way too late. And now I think I've just I've <laughs> lost a lot of my edge because I am aware of, you know, that there is someone on the other end listening to this stuff. And sometimes that might not vibe very well with them. And so, you know, I, I, I just I wonder what it would have been like to do stand up comedy when I was 23 in, or 25 in the year 2005 before Twitter was even a thing. And you could just act like a fucking idiot on stage and be completely reckless with your thoughts and not have there be that many consequences now as there are now. So are there any things, any tips you would give someone to not to not want to not be hurdled by that and just dread on that and uh, as opposed to like. Yeah, I don't know. Just I would say be okay with doing it late or being under that pressure. Yeah, I would say that that the one I'm feeling right now. So I, I have this tendency to look at everything through rose colored glasses, right? Where I go, Oh, it would have been so much better. I would have not felt any of this anxiety when I did this when I was 25. But that's just not the truth, right? right. The truth is every time you step out of your comfort zone and do something new, you're going to feel weird. And it's going to feel like you're not accepted. And it's going to feel 
like you're not finding your group of people for a while. It's the same as going to high school for the first time or any or college, right? I guess high school wouldn't be the case. College would be a better example because high school, you knew people from, from, you know, primary, like grade school and junior high and stuff like that. When I went to college, I was like, holy shit, this is a brand new environment. I'm a fish out of water. I don't feel accepted here. It takes a time. It just takes time. And you have to find people that you vibe with and hopefully find your crew. And because I haven't done it necessarily yet in San Francisco, it doesn't mean you can't. But that creative endeavor, that creative anxiety is always going to be there no matter what you do. So you just need to kind of accept that it's going to be there and just push forward. Awesome. Awesome. Thank Josh, you. did you have something you wanted to uh, bring up? I was just going to make a joke that if Nick had started in his 20s, he could have been on Joe Rogan by now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to go to Texas, though. I'd have to fly to Texas. Rogan's in such an interesting place. I don't, do, you guys, do you guys listen oh, to, to Jerry at all? So obviously a huge influence in my life over the last six years since I started, or seven years since I started kind of funny, started doing jiu-jitsu, started doing stand-up, <laughs> largely because of Joe Rogan. Um, because I feel like those two, those two activities for him, I shouldn't say activities, but those two callings for him have made a huge difference in his life. And I've already seen them make a big difference in my life, um, you know, already. And so, but it's, it's fascinating watching him progress because I think he's, the Spotify deal is just, is so interestingly weird. And I'm not sure if it's a positive or a negative thing yet. And because a lot of people are like, oh, he's sold out. He's going to Spotify. And they're already having issues with content. He had Alex Jones on and people are like, oh, fucking Spotify can't be happy with that. But I think he's, <laughs> I have a theory that he's just going to milk those Spotify dollars for as much as humanly possible and then go back to go back to iTunes. But it's yeah. weird, man. He's in, like him being in Texas was is so strange to me because he's such a staple in the LA scene. And he is, I don't know if you guys watched um the Comedy Store documentary on Showtime. If you haven't, it's really, really good. It's a bit disjointed as far as how it's edited, unfortunately. It doesn't tell the story quite as succinctly as I'd hope it would. But they have a, I think episode four is just called Joe Rogan Returns. And it's about how he basically, him coming back and him bringing all these other people with him, like Bill Burr and all these high level comics back, created this wonderfully perfect environment that allowed the comedy store to thrive and really made the comedy store the mecca of, of stand up comedy again, pretty much worldwide. And the fact that he has left, the fact that, that, Joey Diaz has left the fact that now all these other comedians are thinking about just spreading back out into the United States kind of breaks my heart a little bit because there's still a part of me that's like, man, I, I'll never be a comedy store guy. I'm too old, too old for it now. And and I'm coming up in San Francisco. So if I get passed at any club first, it's going to be punchline and punchline is going to be hopefully my home club. Um, but the comedy store is like, if you're, if you're a comedy store regular, if your name's on that wall, fuck, that is like, that is the biggest badge of honor. And the fact that that might not be as awesome as it once was because he moved is kind of sad for me. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, definitely. That was actually one of my questions was, do you think you, you'd ever like do a set at, at the comedy store or um, what's the other one? I've talked yeah. to Makuga and Ellis about, we've, we've wanted to do a, because you can rent out the belly room and just do shows there. People do it all the time. Like smaller producers like myself or promoters that have shows, you can do those shows. Like you do it at Cobbs, you can do it at Punchline. You just go, hey, I want the Tuesday night, like book it. And then I'll bring my own audience and you guys sell tickets and we'll split the door or however, I don't know how that works. So you can, you can rent out the belly room. But there's a difference between doing that and being a paid regular at the comedy store. I don't know if you guys know the difference between those terms. But the idea of anyone can, you, you can perform at the comedy store tomorrow if you wanted to. You just figure out how to rent that room out, get 20 or get 50 people in the audience and call yourself a comic and go up. But that doesn't make you a, a comedy store comic, right? What makes you a comedy store comic makes you, is that you become a paid regular. And what that means is the booker who is um, named Adam Egott looks at you and says, you got what it takes to be, you have, you hit the quality mark that is the highest possible quality mark for a club, which is the comedy store. You hit that mark, you're a paid regular now. And you get to call in and you get sets and you get to follow people like Joe Rogan or Bill Burr. Granted, you're following them probably three hours later at two o'clock in the morning, but you're still on that lineup with them. And that is an incredibly important and powerful thing, specifically for a comic, because nobody ever really tells you, and I'm sure you guys understand this, when you've sort of made it as a podcaster. <laughs> You know what I mean? When you're a YouTuber, people go, oh, congratulations, you got some views on that and you're making some money. And it just sort of progresses like that. And I remember when I interviewed Greg for We Have Cool Friends, I asked him that question, like, do you feel like you've made it? And he was like, no, because 
we just, things just keep plugging along and they grow slowly. And then you look back and you got a business and that's cool. But as a comic, if you can get past at the comedy store, that is like, that's next level. That's like to put it in terms of like, I guess to put it in terms of jujitsu, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that at all, but that's like, that's like getting your brown belt. You know, you're like almost a black belt at that point. Like you're, you're getting to the point where you're like, oh, I'm almost, well, I guess actually getting past would be like a purple. You're at the point where you're like, I'm on the road to being a professional. I could be a headliner. I can be big. My dreams might come true at that point. And that's pretty fucking cool. Awesome. Yeah, to put it into rugby yeah. terms, uh, go Booker, that'd be like, that'd be like getting into the World Cup. <laughs> You don't have to win, but you're just getting in there. That's like a step in, in, in the right direction. That's very true. That's very true, yeah. <laughs> for us nerds, it's like finally getting that platinum trophy in a game. Well, for like, I mean, for me, it would be like, I think it would be the equivalent to, I guess for YouTube, no, not really. Because getting a million subscribers is really fucking hard. But like, that's kind of how I think about it. I always think about things in terms of like levels, right? Which is a bad way to think about them sometimes. But that's why I'm drawn to things like jujitsu because I love the idea of different colored belts. And I love the idea of seeing the progress, like actual physical, something representing your, your pro, like a physical item representing your progress. Yeah. And so to me, that's why like when I got my blue belt, I was like, this is the fucking best accomplishment I've ever gotten. I broke so many bones and I've bled so much for this fucking just piece of colored fabric that i'm now going to tire on my waist um but but i don't even know what my point was i just think that's yeah i, don't, I forgot what we were talking about <laughs> i just cut off, cut off oh no i think oh, that's what i was gonna say so for youtube you know youtube has those milestones but they're just so fucking far away right like you get the you get your your, your silver play button when you hit 100k which we've gotten two of now um, but then the next mile marker is or milestone is a fucking million subscribers yeah. and man, it is hard to get to that. And subs don't really mean anything because ultimately at the end of the day, all that matters really is how many views you're getting and how, how engaged your audience is. But it, I just can't like, I can't even imagine what it's like hitting a million subscribers. That's gotta be such a cool feeling. I can't even imagine what it's like hitting <laughs> 200 subscribers. Well, that that <laughs> that starts to come faster as as things go. So I think the I think the progression in the beginning starts to get a little bit faster, and then it just <laughs> slows down. And then when, once you hit around, I would assume two hundred and eighty thousand subscribers is really when it gets tough. <laughs> yeah, because we are just we. Yeah, are it just always. Tired. It's always Sorry. crazy to me looking at uh, how many subscribers you guys have, and then to like look at the videos and see like fourteen thousand views. Yeah, it's just like crazy to me. That may, that's that's kind of normal from what I've seen. So if you look at bigger channels that have millions of subscribers, like look at Funhouse, I think they have like a million and a half or something like that at this point, and their videos get about ten percent of what they've got, maybe twenty percent of what they got. So we're kind of on that mark two ish, not maybe. I think we get about ten percent of what our subscriber base is for our bigger videos. The podcasts get like twenty to thirty thousand, and we also have um, a fair amount of we do actually a lot of views with with podcasts which i don't think of because you don't see those they're not as as visible um but that kind of makes sense but it's like just think about growth as far as that's concerned right scalability you need if you want to get videos that are consistently doing a hundred thousand views you need a million subscribers by that math and that's just so daunting and then you look and i'm such a shit i'm such a little fucking insecure shit i'll look at these fucking kids that are like, here, I'm unboxing a toy. And I'm like, you little fucker. You got 2 million subscribers <laughs> and you don't even know. You're going to have fucking 80 million subscribers by the time you're 10. Or you see these like beauty vloggers and I'm just like, you were just, you were born pretty. I don't understand it. But I know there's a ton of work that goes into that too. But there's just such a part of my insecurity that's like, these people have it easy. They just got it. And I'm, I'm sure like you, you know, I've, I've talked to some of our, obviously our friends that have a million subscribers. They work their ass off to get there. Yeah. Um, but I think oftentimes, like, I just look at the visibility of it and I'm like, it just seems so easy for you. How come we can't do it? <laughs> but it's also not necessarily a metric that we ever need to hit. Right. Yeah. I have a solution. Get on TikTok and learn how to do backflips. You'll, you'll be a millionaire. <laughs> you know, TikTok, TikTok is one of those, is, is just one of those things where I'm like, <laughs> do we all not remember the unbelievable collapse of Vine? Do we God, not? I miss Vine. Are we God. all just Good doomed to continually repeat ourselves? Vine wasn't sustainable. What makes anyone think that TikTok is? It's just. I think the difference is such a waste of time. Vine was like going out of their way to, like, put people up. Like they had like an apartment complex where they were bringing all of their big viners, I guess you could call them, and like they were living. Yeah. So they were 
shelling out money, whereas TikTok just seems like it's, hey, make content. We don't give a shit. We're not going to give you a house or anything. Just make content. And people watch it. People watch the dumbest crap on TikTok. I was on there for like a month and I would scroll through it every night and I'd find one video I thought was great and then 10 videos where it's like a really stupid filter where somebody is like, hey, I'm going to play this sound and my cat's going to freak out or... Right. I can. You, t- you told me you like that video, Gage. <laughs> <laughs> took me ages to record. But just like, see, that's, that's, that's so what much you garbage. Me, though, is still TikTok to me. Like, I, I, everyone's like, you got to get on TikTok because then it learns what you like and then it'll just refer it to what you like. TikTok is garbage, but it's got the views. <laughs> where if you, right. if you put up like a minute long clips on there, you can get some views, which is. I just feel like as a society. Cool, yes. As a society, and 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 granted, this is just because of the way we've monetized our business, <laughs> that those those views just tend to be throwaway, and 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 all no, they're and, and granted, all they're good at getting people to follow you, and a bigger following means that you can eventually leverage that for greater things, but it's just it's so funny in my in my career, the stuff that I, that's been sustainable has been the longer form content where we do sit here and be, we talk about good topics and give people you know a couple hours of content but everyone always wants that quick hit like can i do a backflip and get 50 million views i just don't see a huge value in that and i've never seen the industry figure out how to heavily monetize that but everyone thinks that tiktok everyone's like tiktok's the new thing it's gonna be great but i would not be surprised in five years if it goes bankrupt right um you know because i just feel like it's gonna it's so impossibly hard to monetize that how do you make money off of it yeah well like Twitter had a hard time making money. I, I forget who owns it now. I'm probably speaking. It's probably owned by, I think, who owns it? Like, well, I thought Microsoft was going to buy it when Trump was trying to get him to sell it. But I think, is it a Chinese it, company? Yeah, it's a Chinese company that owns Yeah, so TikTok. they probably don't give a fuck about making money. <laughs> They're probably just like, <laughs> let's just dominate the U.S., the, the teens of the U.S., and make them addicted to our product. Yeah. But whatever. It's a lot easier than dishing out heroin to the community. It is heroin, <laughs> though, right? It is, it is, it is that same yes. level of... I mean, that's the thing. That's that's why I stay away from these things because I just feel like there's not a lot of I just feel like it's a it's a it tends to be after a while a tremendously empty experience. Where and, and this is the pro and, and I know this, but people are like you're not on TikTok, you don't understand, but I am on Instagram and I scroll through Instagram wow. and I scroll through Facebook and I scroll through Twitter endlessly. And after about five minutes, I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. It's the same 15, like how many funny, like it's the same thing over and over again. And yeah. that's not to say that I, I love Instagram because I love seeing what's going on in my friends' lives and I like to inter- I like to interact that way. And I think there's a level of artistry that you can achieve on Instagram that's difficult to do on the other platforms. But like I follow the chive, for instance, right? And I can tell you right fucking now that if I opened up my phone, it's gonna be one of three things. Okay. It's gonna be a funny meme, it's gonna be an inspirational meme, or it's gonna be a half naked woman. That's yeah. what it's gonna be. <laughs> that's all they do. So one of them is going to be like, you know, and they get me every fucking time. This dad shaved his head because, you know, because his kid had something or whatever. And you're like, oh, that's really inspirational. Fucking it makes me believe that humanity is good again. And then I scroll down and it's like, here's a dude getting hit in the nutsack. And you're like, well, okay, there goes that. And then it's like a naked woman. And I'm like, well, okay, what the fuck am I like this? I don't need this experience. I don't need this little hit of adrenaline. I could just go outside and go for a walk. Yeah. But I don't begrudge anyone. I guess this is what people do at night when they want to go to bed. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Props I guess to you for like quitting after five minutes though, because I had to delete the app off of my phone. I just, I just, everyone, <laughs> when everyone was hard up on Vine, I tried. I was like, oh, I'll try, I'll try looking at Vine. And I'm like, I just don't think you can accomplish anything of depth in seven seconds. And this is what I always look at. I'm like, where is the value with these things? What is the the value, the inherent value? Because to me, when you watch something like, I just bring it back full circle, you watch The Dark Knight. Right. That is a piece of art that thousands of hours went into. And it is something that's going to outlive us all and be a classic that people remember for at least 50 to 100 years. People will look back and say, holy shit, this was like the first really good, like really, 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 really good comic book movie, like based on Batman. And I just look at that and I go, well, then, but people don't want to put that much time in, right? They don't want to put that much effort in because it's too big of a risk versus the reward. So what do they do? Well, they get on TikTok and they lip sync to music and then they get yeah. that hit of, you know, they get that hit of like, oh, well, you're, you're famous now. You have a one point, you have a million views on this. And I'm like, but what is the value in it? What have you done? 
what, what have you cultivated as an artist? And this is what I struggle with as a, as a stand-up because su- I'm not good at stand-up comedy, but I've been doing it for four years and I'm getting slightly better. So I almost get offended when I see people who are like, I'm going to do, I'm just going to do this silly thing and it, and it works. And then I guess they just replicate it. But like, I don't know, maybe I'm just being too catty with it or maybe I'm being too too insecure when it comes to that stuff. But I just don't see the the same level of value in that as there is in like watching Bill Burr or watching Dave Chappelle on SNL where he yeah. is like a guy that's been doing it for 30 fucking years and he's the best that probably there ever will be at stand-up. And I look at that, and I'm like, that's time better spent. That guy's inspiring to me. Looking at how he crafts that 16 minutes where he knows he has a good portion of the nation's attention and he can actually say something and maybe, maybe just like make the world a little bit of a better place. That's art. Somebody doing a backflip on Instagram or somebody doing like a well, really well choreographed lightsaber duel on fucking YouTube. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. And it's like, it's missing something. It just feels so superficial. Yeah. Now on the flip side, what if you took some I of see the, what you like, did there. see what you did there to <laughs> 30 seconds um clips from like kind of funny episodes that were super funny and threw them up on tiktok just to have a kind of funny uh page on tiktok and then people click on that kind of funny logo then they see oh hey they have a youtube page here or a, they could they go to kind of funny.com sure. and you kind of permeate yourself that way yeah and i think that's okay. what i think that's what a lot of vine guys did back in the day too right like vine compilations became a huge thing on youtube and that yeah. was something that i thought that i mean i'd be remiss if i didn't say that i would watch <laughs> some of those and laugh my fucking ass off specifically with will sasso and the goddamn oh, God. yeah which i thought was hilarious um so i mean i'm obviously a little hypocritical here because i have engaged in this stuff and there's some stuff that gets me in is just is is elevated um and i guess the same could be said for everything out there right which is like how many youtube videos have you watched we're like this is just fucking garbage it's 15 minutes long of just utter garbage a lot of them on kind of funny um but you know so it is everything out there is just a vast sea of of crap punctuated by some beautifully wonderfully made things um but yeah i think i think as a marketing tool sure tiktok works i mean that's the same with with syndicating your content on on, on twitter or facebook um and you have to do some 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 part of that i just when i see people endlessly scrolling through something and not really laughing i just think wow you're that's like being it, it reminds me of smoking cigarettes it really does it reminds me of going out there and just endlessly smoking cigarettes because i had nothing better to do with my time and that was so self-destructive yeah i gotta say just kind of piggybacking off of that same thing shout out to you guys doing more of the like uh uh social media breakouts i've noticed like the kind of funny Facebook page or Twitter page, you guys are starting to put a lot more like 15 second highlights from this podcast or whatever up. And that's, yeah, that's definitely something that, yeah, there's so like, so when you guys, as the business grows, you get, you know, you have to make those strategic sort of like moves. And that was one of the things I think Tim specifically has been wanting to do for a really long time, which is just try to figure out um, how to get just some of those quicker hit, smaller things out there that can work as, as marketing material for us that can get people to, to see it. I, I love them all. I think, I think they're great, but I, I don't have the correct perspective on them because obviously I remember the joke and I remember what it's like being in there. So like hearing right. you guys say, Oh, those are actually good. Uh, makes me happy because I think everything we do is simultaneously genius and the worst thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm perfect. not kidding. Like, I think, I think I'm fucking hilarious and also just the worst Oh thing no! Ever spend your time I'm, listening. To. I'm the same. So when we first started doing this stuff, like I watched our first, I, I watched our first two podcasts we did. I haven't been able to watch anything else we've ever done. I haven't even watched the Tim episode yet because I watched that and I'm like, oh, I, I said um too many times there. Oh, I did this. Oh, I did that. It's like oh, this sucks, and I just can't do it yeah. anymore. Well, so you I, know what? If yeah. when you're fortunate enough to have tens of thousands of people watching your content, they will do that for you. They will let you know <laughs> all the annoying things you do on camera that, you know, there was, I mean, I could tell you right now that the, and, and you know, you're always learning and you're always hopefully getting better, especially if you're, and that's the same thing I have to do when I'm a comic. I just literally, I'm four years into comedy. I finally bought this, which is a tripod. So I can actually start recording oh, my yeah. set so I can start watching myself. And that's yeah. incredibly important because I, I hate watching myself, but fortunately there have been um people out there like ben who are just willing to be assholes and and tell me (laughs) all of the things all the small personality quirks or the or how i'm you know i I remember originally when we first started doing the podcast it was nick stop talking over everyone 
And that was, I'm like, fuck you guys, I'll do whatever I want. And then I finally went back and listened. I was like, oh, I do really have a tendency to talk over people. And that took me years. I still do it, you know. Um, it's harder now though, because we all talk over each other with with doing all this stuff remotely. But yeah, you let you learn. You live and learn. You have to have that level of going back and watching it. It sucks. I hate it, but you that, have to do it. That's the exact criticism I got from people for the first couple episodes, right? I just kept going and going, and Kamel would be like, Gage shut the fuck up it's my turn i'm like oh sorry you're right <laughs> i mean there is a there's a moment in i think it's the documentary we did waiting for the punchline that tim pulled a piece of footage when i was talking about something stupid about one of our first podcasts i think i was talking about the simpson writer and greg or writers for the simpsons and why i i, I respected them because they were like all from harvard i was talking to my ass like i always knew and greg just interrupts me and goes what the fuck are you talking about and it's true because I was like, I don't know. I'm just trying to fill air. I don't, I don't know what else to do. And yeah. I'm sure you guys understand this. Like, sometimes you just have to f- keep the energy going one way or the other, and it's not always great. But that's your job as a podcaster is to make entertaining content. You can't have a 15 minute oh, that's dead air break. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't know if anyone told you that. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't get that the starter booklet. No, hmm. is that like come in a bundle with how to use Instagram by Tim Gettys? Yeah, that's exactly right. God bless Tim. <laughs> One day. My, if I had more wherewithal, I'm so stupidly competitive when it comes to these things. I just love I just love trying to be competitive and pissing people off, but I don't actually have the energy to do it. But man, I, I'm like, I'm so close to Tim on Instagram when it comes to followers. I'm just like, how do I get more? Because <laughs> I'm never gonna catch up. I'm never gonna catch up to him on Twitter. He's so good at Twitter. But I feel like I feel like I'm like I actually vibe with Instagram. When I'm on rolls, I start getting like really good content out on that platform um well i shouldn't say good content silly pictures of me on the platform but it's just one of those things that you I, sometimes i have to make it into a competition to, to get through the anxiety of actually posting something because i'm always like who the fuck cares if i have a playstation 5 does anyone really care but then i post that and five thousand likes i'm like i guess they do i guess people yeah. are interested in that aspect of my life and you know and then i post about a show that i'm doing that i'm super proud of and 500 people like it i'm like god damn it what am i doing <laughs> yep i don't know yeah it's night, dude. you know I know everyone liked that. And it was was honestly, I did that. I did Nick at night because that was actually something that came up uh, in a therapy session of all things. when I was talking to a therapist and I was like, I just don't, I don't have what it takes. I don't like posting on social media. I don't like social media. Um, And I don't like it not because I don't think it has a good place or you can't make good content on it. It just gives me a lot of anxiety to put things out there that are either personal to myself or I feel like I'm basically like, I feel like social media is the equivalent sometimes to like knocking on a random stranger's door and saying, hey, let me tell you a joke or let me interrupt your life for five seconds right now. Um, And so I just get so weird about it sometimes. And Tim, thank God I have Tim in my life because he's like, you're overthinking this shit. Nobody fucking cares. Just put it out there. (laughs) And it's just, you know, for the most part, for most people, it's just something they're going to check while they're in the line at Starbucks or, or they're taking a shit or something like that. But I just feel like I have this responsibility at all times to make something like worthwhile for people. And that's such a big responsibility to put on your shoulders and i don't think anyone has that expectation when it comes to social media except for me definitely Mm. okay i don't even know what i'm talking about anymore sorry (laughs) (laughs) neither do i um no that's great i I completely agree with social media like it has its place but yeah like so too much is yeah not great yeah it says the man who posts eight photoshops a day yeah that's 800 now dude Come on, smart. I mean, that's 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 cool. That's that that's the way to do it, though, right? It's just to put that energy into something fun that you love, and then hopefully have it resonate. I just, I just, it's hard for me because what I really want to do is like silly comedy videos on my Instagram. I just don't have the time for it. I just don't have the wherewithal, you know? Yeah. So, kind of piggybacking off of that, I want to bring up another question from a community member. This sure. is from at Ringboy Mason. So this is a two-parter, okay. um, and I actually really like this one. So not that I didn't like the other ones, but. but <laughs> This one's this one's markedly better. Everyone else try Screw harder. Screw BJ, yeah. whatever his name was. Okay, uh, so part one, was there ever a standout pitch for a KFAF bit that you feel should have made production? And part two was, what piece of KF, uh, uh, kind of funny content do you feel is underrated? Um, part one, KFAF bits. No, usually when people pitch stuff, they were it was funny and we would just go with it because that show, doing that show every week was just you know, it's, it's tough. That was, that was a hard one to do because you're putting a lot of resources into something that 
um, you have to repeat every week. So anytime anyone had even a remotely funny idea, I was like, cool, we're going with that. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. And then we yeah. would just go into production <laughs> with it. Um, and then underrated pieces of content. Um, everything we do, <laughs> I feel is... like should be, <laughs> I feel fair. like should, yeah. But then there's some stuff that like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I always just, I, I just always want more people to see our stuff. Cause I think a lot of the stuff we do, anytime you put, you guys know, you guys have made the comedy videos that take weeks and months and hours to do. You always want those to like go to become millions of view videos. But you know, I'm always like, every time I put something silly out that I think is hilarious, I'm like, this is going to be great. It's going to go viral. And it's just, it's more often than not, we get a decent amount of views on it, but it's just, it's just another reminder that to rely on your core audience. Those are the people. If you're, if you're trying to hopefully go viral with every piece of content, it's just not reality and you don't need to, and nor, nor should you, because the strength of what we do as a group really does rely on the community. It is that community building is that fact that we can make a stupid spirit Halloween joke and people get it because they watch games daily or they watch PS. I love you wherever that joke originated. I don't even know. And, uh, and, and the Halloween King is a thing and they think it's hilarious, but so you, you know, striking that balance is always hard, but I think we always manage. I think we always make the right call, which is when you're going to make something funny, make it sincere to the people who, you who will understand it and if outside people find it funny too well that's just that's cool that's icing on the cake that's honestly one of the things i love about kind of funny and often i do we'll, we'll watch a video or something i think you know why, why the hell do you guys not have a million subscribers or hey, get millions of views <laughs> and i think <laughs> then i think you know there's a point in communities on, on online content with youtube where you guys start to break away from the community in a way you, the, you become separated in a sense. And I've seen it with a lot of bigger creators. And that's the thing I love about Kind of Funny is you guys are still small enough that you're still so involved with the community and the community is such a big part of your content. I mean, yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's arguably our biggest asset. I mean, look what we're doing right now, right? This is, I was looking forward to this. I woke up this morning, I got three cups of coffee. We might clean my kitchen. I was like, my wife's like, what do you do? I was like, I'm gonna go up on, on a podcast with a bunch of guys that fucking roast me every week. And she's like, does that sound fun? I was like, yeah, it's gonna be fun. Don't worry about it. And then they're gonna tell me what PS5 game to buy. Um, but all yeah, I mean, that's all of them, I know. <laughs> but that's, um, that's, I mean, that's, we're fortunate to have that. And hopefully we can, we can continue to do that. And honestly, I mean, I joke about wanting a million subscribers, but Greg has talked about this before, but I would trade a million subscribers in a heartbeat for what we have right now. If those million subscribers meant that we didn't really know anyone that was that you know we were affecting with our with our content um and we'll get there eventually you know that's that's part of the it's part of the deal if it was easy to get there everyone would do it right but yeah. we've and we had that we did have that reach when we were at ign and it was something that was cool and it was awesome to be able to put videos out but honestly even at ign it was like it was difficult to to get those bigger view videos because they were more of a news outlet and so when you're making that kind of content you're gonna you're going to have a certain level of sustainable growth that's just not going to be on the same level as some of the bigger, you know, sites out there. But we'll get there eventually. Yeah, hopefully one day I we just can. Got one question, it Gage, uh, Go for it. Before we carry on, Nick, when are you guys going to review Indiana Jones for interview? Oh, we're going to do Indiana Jones. I will do it eventually. I think. Are um, you making another I know one there still? was grumblings of five. Yeah. yeah. So. Tim, I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not, but there's not, it's not necessarily the hardest thing to figure out. We'll generally do the in review. So, okay, if there's a new movie in a series coming out, you can count backward from the weeks of when that movie is going to release by how many subsequent sequels or prequels it has had. You can count backward week wise for that. And that's when we'll start doing Indiana Jones in review. Unless it's so Fast and Furious. When, when five comes out, We'll go, if you count four weeks before that, that's when we'll start doing, we'll do Raiders of the Lost Art that week. But yeah, I mean, I've been obviously saying that the ultimate, uh, the ultimate hype man follows the hype train. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> He's smart about that. But that's, that's what's, I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't say that in any way, shape or form as like a negative thing because it's really smart because people get excited, right? Yeah. The closer you get to these movies, all the marketing stuff starts coming up. That's when people start talking about this stuff. See, if it was left to me, I'd be like, we're just going to review Die Hard every week. And man, I'll tell you what, <laughs> what is not culturally that relevant anymore is Die Hard. Yeah. But these are movies like 
I love these 80s movies where I'm like, we should watch Poltergeist and review Poltergeist. And Tim's like, nobody fucking cares about Poltergeist. They're going to get, <laughs> you know, it's going to get 5,000 views because you think it's funny and the other 40-year-old in the audience thinks it's great, but who cares about that? So you have to be, you have to be smart. And that's one of the things I really respect about Tim is that he's a great content creator, but he's also a great strategist. And he understands how to marry those two of, yeah, Nick, you want to make that great content. Cool, but there's a time and a place for it. Just have some patience. And when Die Hard 6 comes out, then we'll do Die Hard in review, right? Or eventually we'll do like when another Alien movie comes out, we'll do Alien versus Predator. We'll do all those and all, that'll be, be super awesome. fun and cool. And we'll, we, we, will, we will do all those eventually because of course we will, but we have to be very strategic yeah. about that. I'm still waiting have for- Have we announced what we're doing next after Conjuring? I don't think so. No, not yet. Okay. I can't say then. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. I'm I'm still waiting for Rocky in review though, because I know Tim mentioned that because Creed mm -hmm. three they confirmed Michael B. Jordan's directing. That's for sure gonna happen. That, I. That's like the the big after Lord of the Rings. That's the one. I'm like these these guys better fucking do Rocky. No, we'll do Rocky. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, first off, I love Rocky. Fantastic. The original Rocky is one of them. The, They're all one, great actually, except for five. Ever made. Five is trash, but the rest are good. Two and two and three. Get, it'll get a little weird They're, four is strange five they five get is progressively not good. more like traditional 80s action flick as they go on i'll tell you four i'll tell you how four is incredible you, but I'll, it's a superhero movie at that point it is it is it is the four if, i don't know how old you guys are but growing up in the 80s four was the most propaganda driven 80s action film i've ever like <laughs> he single-handedly beat the russians yeah and then was like hey yo we beat you Let's all be friends. And it's yeah. like, cool. It didn't happen. <laughs> We're still pretty our, – our relationship with Russia is still tenuous <laughs> at best. Um, but I, I, love, I love the Rocky franchise because in the Rocky franchise, you see the full myriad of a type of movie that those movies can be. The yeah. first one is legitimately just a lovely t story of a guy who just didn't want to be a bum. And it's a yeah. great drama. It features actually really good acting across oh, the board. Yeah. And it's great. The two is just a – um just a unabashed money grab so they were like we need to make the same we're just gonna make the same movie over again but he's gonna win this time okay to be fair he though is he was also a bit more than that i mean sure it was very much the same exact no, movie it's, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good him, movie yeah dealing with yeah. fame finally uh, uh you know proposing to adrian, to adrian. Yeah, it's great. Um, and then three is when it becomes ridiculous. That's when he it starts off with him wrestling Hulk Hogan. And then four, so he good. beats Russia. And then five, they were like, we should stop making these movies. And then something five weird happens so with with Rocky Balboa. I love it gets that movie. Good again. It's so bizarre how yeah. good that movie wound up being. And then Creed comes out and you're like, fuck you. This is a great movie. <laughs> how did you take a movie? Where it was like him fighting Mr. T and Hulk Hogan three movies ago. And now I'm like crying because I'm watching this really, really, really like good character drama happen in front of me. Okay. It was really good. And Creed 2 was good too. Yeah. They just, I, yeah, they, they really brought those series back. But is there okay. not every 80s franchise? It's the first one's fantastic Die Hard, Rambo, Rocky. And then immediately it just becomes, goes into like commando territory where it's just balls to the wall <laughs> action. Yeah, there's, a, um, <laughs> there's a great documentary about that called in search of the last action hero which if you know <laughs> anything about titles for movies last action hero was obviously a, a shane black movie starring Arnold schwarzenegger and it was one of the um it's it's actually kind of got a deeper meaning because i think a lot of people say that was the movie that really that was the first big fuck up on arnold schwarzenegger's part that was the kind of thing that led to his eventual <laughs> career as, a, as an action star um dying and then he did like end of days after that in Eraser. And it was just like, oh shit, you became a bit, you, 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 you fell from the throne very quickly. But they talk about that. And they talk about how these movies that came out that were actually really beautifully done, like First Blood, which was based on a book. And it really was about disenfranchised soldiers coming back from Vietnam. It wasn't about, it wasn't an action movie. And then you cut to Rambo 2 and it's a fucking like <laughs> prequel where he's got a, a, a machine gun in one hand, taking down helicopters and shooting yeah. RPGs with the other. And you're like, how did we come so far away from that original one? And it's just, it's such a, it's a great documentary. It, it talks about Canon films and how they like, how they did all this crazy shit. It's really good. I saw the Canon films documentary. Uh, that one's on recommendation. Like, that's fucking great. great. Awesome. How old, Al, how old are you? 35. Okay, so you probably remember some of those movies from when you were younger. Oh yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you remember like the Masters of the Universe or Superman Four: The oh, Quest yeah. for Peace, or like that weird <laughs> Spider-Man movie they tried to make. But those movies were like, I grew up on that. I grew up on the American Ninja movies, 
And and I was I remember watching when I was a kid. I was like, I don't think these are movies. I don't. There's something off, but I didn't study. I didn't know what was, I, I didn't know what an, the idea of a, a low budget film was. I just thought everything was created equal. And sometimes you got Star Wars, and sometimes you got you know Michael Dudikoff running around in a ninja costume. But <laughs> it's, to go back and watch the story of canon films, which if you guys haven't watched, please watch it this weekend. It is. It's like watching Firefest. It's like it's bonkers. You're like these guys. There's no way they got away with some of this shit, and they did. And they actually ended up making movies that were that made money. It's fucking crazy. Hmm. I'll have to check it out. Cause I don't. It sounds familiar, but I don't think I've actually it's called, watched. The movie's it called not. Electric Boogaloo. So they made a movie called Electric. They made a movie called Breakin. I think it's yeah. It's called Breakin One. And uh, then they made another movie called Breakin Two: Electric Boogaloo. And then the documentary is based, named off of that second one, I believe, because the second one, the first one was basically, they, they operated off the mentality of like when major studios would make like a slate of 20 movies a year, they'd make like 80 with the thought that one of them would be big and it would fund the slate for the next year. And so they made Breakin' and it blew up because it was the first real breakdancing movie. And it was like, you know, kind of a cool like look at breakdancing on the streets and things like that. And it was so big that they immediately banged out Breaking 2 and it was just terrible. And and that's and so that was their that became their sort of the theme of canon films of like when something's good, run it into the ground. Make sure you immediately fuck it up and like try to make as much money off of it as possible. But but it's also an inspirational story about got two guys that just really liked making films and just want to do whatever it possibly took to make them, even though sometimes the legalities of it or the morality of it wasn't there. Um, but there's something special about that. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I grew up on those two. It might not resonate with you guys because you guys probably are like, what the fuck are all these pieces of shit movies? <laughs> but like... But a lot of them, like, I mean, they made, like, some of the earlier Jean-Claude Van Damme films and um, a lot of those things. So it was cool. So now I'm, I might be an infant, but my, my parents are in their 60s. So <laughs> I watched all of that from, like, 1950 to 1990. That's oh, my you ca- yeah, you caught them all, man. Yeah. So you caught, like, man, I'm trying to think of some of the some of the better ones. But they made, like, it's just, like, it's just so fascinating. They literally, like... Those guys and a few of the other ones, I and mean, then all these documentaries build into each other. But I was watching another documentary on like YouTube, a bunch of people who were talking about ninja and how the idea of the ninja was a product of the late seventies and early eighties, and how like all of the mythos of what we think of as the modern day ninja has zero zero basis in reality in like Japan, zero. Yeah. Just like the idea of the ninja in Japan or I, and I might be misspeaking. So, you know, chat, let me know in the comments below if I'm a dumb shit, (laughs) but, um, but like the idea of the ninja back in the day was just like, you were just like a spy. Basically you were just a person that was using some level of subterfuge to, to work for whoever you're working for, whether it be a Shogun or the government or whatever. It wasn't until the 80s, seventies and eighties movies started making the ninja what it was that it became this like mythical creature and that helped propel the myth that martial arts were like, like the, like karate and Kung Fu and ninjutsu and all these things are like the end all be all of like self-defense. And like when I grew up in the eighties, if you had a black belt in anything, you were a superhero, you were a fucking God. It wasn't until the UFC that I was like, Oh, they're not all disciplines are created equal. Like if you, have a black belt in jujitsu you have a significant advantage over people who like like my purple belt in kempo that took me six months to get right like 10 years of jujitsu training and fucking like to the point where you can't feel your ears or hands anymore is different than me breaking a piece apart like a small piece of like light birch wood and then getting a purple belt yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. You guys can stop me anytime. But like the 80s were such a beautiful time because everything was possible and we believed this shit. And a perfect example is Bloodsport. Have you guys seen this movie? I'm going to break Absolutely. people's hearts here. Okay, I go for it. I tried. I tried. I got yeah, it's, 30 minutes in. I'm like, this movie is awful. It's, it's not so great. B- like Jean Claude Van Damme, uh, it's, he's not a great. Oh, he's a good actor. For Jean Claude Van Damme, right. Seeing him uh, opposite <laughs> other people, he's not great. And the editing in that movie, the the sound mixing is so poor that it's like sometimes you'll hear a kick, it's like ah, and you'll hear it. Other times he'll literally sock someone in the face, and it just sounds like a little poof. 
Like, I mean, who the hell edited this thing? Like, what the, what's going on? John, so, so that builds into the canon documentary because I, I was think I was right. It's a canon movie, and John Clan Van Damme wanted to be the action star so much he would just show up at the offices and like throw high kicks and shit. And eventually, they put him in this movie. Awesome. But the movie is <laughs> supposed to be based on a true story of a guy named Frank Dukes who supposedly really went and fought in this tournament in the eighties. This Kumite tournament, which is an underground tournament where he supposedly had to beat like a hundred people in the span of three days. It wasn't until, and I believed this shit when I was a kid. I was like, fuck, this guy's a badass. If I, if I study what he studied, then I'll be a badass, right? I <laughs> shit you not, guys. Two years ago, I'm sitting by a pool up in Napa with my wife. We're taking a weekend off. And I'm reading, I'm reading this article and it, it says something about how he was full of shit. And I was like, no way. And I click on it and I watch a YouTube. I go down this YouTube rabbit hole about how he was a total pathological liar. And the story has no basis in reality. And he made all this shit up just to make oh, money. And I was like, all of my youth was a lie. I took karate <laughs> because of this guy. Like, these are the things that we believed. It was all marketing bullshit. But I digress. But we got Mortal Kombat out of it. So it makes it okay, right? We really did, and that, and and you know, shout out to them for making all that money. And also, I stand by the fact that the first Mortal Kombat movie is oh, so a phenomenal good. piece of cinematic so history. Oh yeah, still holds up. Second one, not so much. I don't remember the second one. Oh the my first god, one's terrible too. <laughs> but the first second one's one terrible, is terrible, but in a good way. The second in one a is fun like, way, yeah. It, it, honestly, I just remember that. Yeah, I remember the girl that played Sonya, the, the actress that played Sonya. I think I was just like, or maybe I forget who it was. It was like the daughter of Sonya. She's so terrible. Allie so, or something. No, it wasn't Allie. It was the other one. Then it was the one that uh, I think there were two female leads, and the other one I just remember being so bad. I'm like, how the fuck did you get this role? You can't act. <laughs> and then I watched the rest of the movie. I was like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Nobody can act. Nobody can act. That's my fault. <laughs> I, I, that was uh, my expectation was that people were going to bring some level of artistry to this. My bad. Just play the song again. <laughs> play the song again yeah wow there's a lot of bad actors in that movie holy crap yeah, who are than that yeah <laughs> there's a lot of anyway. like no offense to them nobody actors in that movie like people that i've never well, seen anything else except for mortal kombat there's only a couple people that i know are, are in that movie that i remember seeing in other movies and i think i think christopher lambert's in it right yeah the guy from yeah. highlander yeah he's in it and then i think the guy that plays one of the bad guys yeah that guy's been in a bunch yeah. of shit what's his name <laughs> Robin Sue, I think is no, that's not him. Anyway, the, yeah, the bad guy was in a bunch of stuff too. He's been in a ton of movies. I think he was in like uh, Rising Sun and a bunch of other cool movies. Yeah, We're everybody else just kind of. I thought it was really cool that they got him to actually play <laughs> Shang Tsung in the Mortal Kombat Eleven. That's cool. That's rad. Nice. Oh, Kerry, yeah, Kerry Tagawa is his name, and he's been in a ton of shit. <laughs> that guy's a badass. I think the person I was talking to was Talisa Soto. She played Katana, and I just remember she's so bad. Absolutely wait, wait. stiff for sure. No, yeah. Ali Larder wasn't in this one. I think Ali Larder was in the next one. This one was the woman, right. the actress who played opposite of um, Adam Sandler, I think, in like Happy Gilmore or, or Billy Madison. <laughs> yeah, that's her. Ridiculous. Sorry. <laughs> we get in the podcast so now. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are like, let's go home. We are home. <laughs> There's no one else to go. <laughs> that's true. Then you have that's no true. excuse. We'll go for 10 We're more hours. Stranded. If this goes into the night, I've got a bed right back there. So Perfect. Right? Perfect. <laughs> well, it's uh, literally almost 2 a.m. <laughs> what? Dang. <laughs> no, 1 a.m. Sorry. <laughs> Glad you're with us still, Josh. It was nice of you to drop by. Glad you're here. <laughs> I was very uh, worried. I feel I feel bad for Al because he's rocking what two two a.m. right now. Two a.m. Yeah. Yeah. What time is it? In, <laughs> wait, wait, Josh, what time is it in South Africa right now? It's it's one a.m. I was mistaken. Uh, okay. Ten past one. Ten past one. That's not bad. Yeah, it's three or nine for me right now. P.M. Yeah. Yeah, we're p.m. So we're still good. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, Perfect. Ben, did you have anything you wanted to bring up to the group or to Nick? Oh, actually, yeah, a couple of questions. You can you can pick which one. Sure. Um, so I was thinking just in terms of COVID and obviously how you sort of go about, I guess, keeping... Before you keeping... start, Ben, I have to go to the bathroom, yeah. so I'm going to hop off real quick. I'll be right back. <laughs> no worries, buddy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was just wondering just how you sort of keep sharp on the comedy scene, how your other comedian friends are doing around COVID, what they're doing to practice. You might have talked a little bit about it with filming yourself, but what's that kind of look like for you at the moment? So now the shows are have to be basically social distance and COVID compliant. So for the last two months, we've lucked out because some of the restrictions in San Francisco has loosened and we've been able to do some of these parklet shows. So I posted about one on my Instagram with me hanging out a window. 
um, and there's a bunch of tables around you. But that's basically what comedy has turned into now. So it's you go, you wear your mask the whole time. And it's about, you know, 20 to 50 people, depending on how big the parklet is. And they get to sit and have a drink and you can entertain them. But um, a lot of the shows have been Zoom shows. Those are not fun. I've done a couple of those. I did not enjoy those. Um, mm-hmm. And largely, I've let my I've let it kind of fall by the wayside up until about a month ago when I decided, I'm like, hey, we got to get back into this. And of course, in perfect Nick Scarpino timing, um, you know, I'm mounting my own, my own show at the end of this month right when it's probably going to start raining. So that's going to be super fun for everyone that comes out. Come out to that. <laughs> Redandwhite.com slash comedy on the bay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it, there's two ways to look at it. There's the, oh, there's the fatalistic attitude that I usually approach things with where I'm like, oh, this is not even worth my time anymore because mm-hmm. I can't do it X, Y, and Z. And then there's the attitude that you should have, which is, hey, you're in production. And production is just creative problem solving. And this is just another problem to solve. And I think the thing that separates a lot of, really successful standups from the people like me are they're not willing to take no for an answer. They go, well, I want to do a show no matter what. So how do we do this show? How do we, they ask the question, how do we, how, well, how do we do this? We do it outside. What, what can we do right now that can sustain us? So a lot of my friends that do run a bunch of shows who, who will, I have no, uh, no doubt become huge successes in the industry are still running five shows. It's just three of them are online. Two of them are at brunch shows at a bar that's open. And then one of them is by a pool somewhere. Um, and that's just super cool. And that's why I like just hanging out with those guys. I'd like to surround myself with people that are ha- way more motivated toward this stuff than I am. Cause I pick up on some of that. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the other question was just around, I guess what it was like actually going through filming, uh, waiting for the punchline, your documentary. Mm. That was a really fun experience and it was very nerve wracking and going back and watching myself <laughs> be vulnerable on camera and be that bad was, it was tough. Um, but it was ultimately great. And I think I'm super appreciative of like all the people at Rooster, specifically Jeff Ramsey, who helped me get that thing done because he was inspired by it. And literally, I did just an interview with Elise and James where they talked about it again, um, about how they got the opportunity to go up. And that was super cool. So just being able to get all my friends to experience that a little bit was just well worth it. But it was tough because we, for the most part, it was 95% an incredibly positive experience. We just had one showing in, in like Missoula, Montana where I was like, the audience didn't like it. And then I had to go up and ask, answer questions afterward. And it was the most awkward experience ever. And my wife was like, oh, it wasn't that bad. They liked it. It was fine. Everyone was just, it was just tired and cold or whatever. And I was like, no, you don't understand. I bombed in the video. And then I went up and I just, I felt like I watched myself bomb for two hours. And then I had to perform. It was yeah. such, it was so tough. And I, I, I it, that took me forever to shake off. I had, it took me like two weeks to shake that feeling off of just how bad sitting in an audience and watching something that they just don't like how bad that could feel. Cause up until that point, I had just screened it with people that obviously we had known our friends, our audience, Bruce Teeth's audience, everyone loved it. And so it was just, it's, it was just weird. And shout out to that documentary. Yeah. You did an incredible job. Everyone that worked on it, the production, everything is just, just incredible. Oh, those guys killed it. Yeah. And it, honestly, it was one of those things where it was awesome to be able to sort of showcase the scene a little bit. However, little I, I was able to do it because I think there's a lot of great comics working in SF in the Bay Area, and they got to be a part of it, which was cool. Yeah, it was Go beautifully ahead. shot. It was it had a lot of fun bits in it. It was great. Thank you. And a bonus question. Yeah. Um, so I asked him last week this question. Um, I have this theory that potentially Greg Miller could be a clone or a robot, just because you know he's everywhere. Mm-hmm. He's just all over everything. Mm-hmm. Is there any evidence? Tim couldn't tell me if there was any evidence last week. Is there any evidence that you've seen that might back um, that up? No, I have a different theory, if I may. Um, I yeah. don't want to convolute <laughs> this. I think he's just some sort of demon sent from hell to annoy me. <laughs> and I think that he lot, never... So. I think he... Exactly. Okay, so case, <laughs> case in point... He thinks Lucifer, he throws the word Lucifer around all willy nilly. Two, he never sleeps. Three, he seem, <laughs> he has some level of seemingly endless energy that can only come from the dark arts. It can only come from the dark lord himself. And four, he's just too fucking tall. And that's just the kind of shit that, that like that's that's Satan's work right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that theory. That's great. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so demon, I think he's a demon. I'll, I'll add that to the list. That's great. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's my question. So, has anyone got anything else? Yeah, the your previous question about about the documentary kind of leads into something that I really <laughs> wondered about, and 
that's the uh, obviously your wife has has kind of wanted no social media presence, no part of kind of being in the social media sphere, um, and especially with something as intrusive as um, you know the documentary. Um, how have you handled all of that? Like, obviously, you've done an amazing job of of doing that, but um, how has that kind of put a, a damper on things? Because, like, for example, Greg will be doing uh, one of his videos, and um, you know, his wife is just there in the background, right? Um, and right. then we'll interact with the video or something, and that that just happens whenever you're doing any piece of uh, sure. content. So, how have you handled that over the years, and how has that put a strain on what you do? And um, how you know, how has that been kind to of be, to uh, be honest, like, it's to be honest, it's been awesome because basically everywhere I go, I have a person who just will take pictures of me. So I don't have to take selfies anymore. I can just have someone who literally, and to be, and actually the only time we've ever come up against any opposition is where I'm like, babe, can we do that one more time? And she'll, she'll just lower the camera, but we got it. And I'm like, all right, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, cool, cool, cool. No, I won't be the perfectionist. But no, I mean, honestly, it's like, it's kind of nice. It's nice being with someone who can counterbalance me that way because I don't understand how Greg doesn't get lost in it because Jen is on his level as far as wanting to engage in social media. But whereas I'll sit there and be on Instagram and my wife will literally be like, Hey, you can just put that down. We're, we're hanging out. We're having dinner, put your phone. Like we don't have to, and she never says it in like a, like, you know, put, put the phone down or else it's more just like a nice reminder yeah. that, Hey, you, you don't have to experience life through that thing. There's life sitting right in front of you right now. And this is the life you've really chosen to dedicate yourself to. So let's spend some time together. And I can't tell you how many times it's been, I've been like wound up and pissed off about something. I'm like, Oh, this fucking person said this comment or something stupid. And my wife's like, why don't we just go for a walk? You leave your phone here and we'll just go for a walk. And within five minutes, I'm like, all right, that it's, that's, that's just some, a part of my life. That's not the whole part of my life. Um, and so, you know, like, like I told you guys today, like my plans for today were to do this, which is awesome. And I would heavily say this is like, square within that area that we're talking about but then after this i'm going to turn my computer off and go for a walk with my wife and that is that is a just a tremendous privilege and joy that i get to do um that i never take for granted um and it's and it's awesome so i i can't imagine what it's like having a significant other that's as into or more into social media than me because i think it would i think it would drive me into a darker and darker place with that i don't think it would i don't think it would go well with me yeah, being being on such a small scale, like I'm I'm in a very similar situation where my wife supports what I do um, and what I'm trying to do, and um, is there for me on, in every step of the way. But she like wants nothing to do with being part of it. Or and I actually feel very similar to you that she's a nice counterbalance to everything. When I I'm feeling like oh that thing that I did wasn't received very well or whatever she's there to be like you know what it's fine in the end of the day like you don't have to worry about it why don't we just you know chill watch a movie let's cook dinner together like forget about the whole thing absolutely and that's important right because sometimes you have like life really is about that balance and 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 if you have someone that can compliment you to that degree then I think that that's a really important thing awesome Anybody else have anything else they want to uh, bring up or should we leave it at that? I think that was a pretty good. Um, I, I, want, I do want to say one thing. This is kind of a, I, I said it was going to get heavy at one point. Okay. Sure. Um, and I was just talking about, you know, me and what I'm trying to do and, you know, being with you guys, talking with you guys, doing the, the whole simply sassy thing um, is only one facet of, of what I do online. But uh, a few years ago, before I started um, interacting with Kind of Funny and, and watching Kind of Funny content, um, I was kind of like in a really dark place. Like we had just failed as a company. Uh, we released two board games and uh, the first one did fine. We made our money back, but it wasn't like a super big hit. And then uh, the second one that we put out, weird, weirdly enough, had a question mark in the title. Hmm. <laughs> So bringing it back real quick, uh, utterly bombed, utterly bombed. The uh, person that was kind of the head of the company still has like 5,000 copies in their garage of that game uh, that we worked on. And uh, so that was just like a really dark moment. It was like one of those things for me where I was like, I don't want to create anymore. And I just kind of buckled down and started working at my job, um, you know, would go to my nine to five every day, come home. And then my solace was going and listening to kind of funny and kind of um hearing you guys talk and banter and i would lift my spirits for the day and uh kind of get me through 
but the big thing was when uh you guys started kfaf and all of a sudden there was this awesome creative outlet um for me to just kind of get back into doing things and i started submitting to the photoshop challenge mm um and it was such a huge boost to my confidence um when i made it on the show with my very first entry um and then from then on i was hooked like i i was there every week um you know just like making these silly photoshops trying to get onto the show and having a lot of fun uh being a creator and, and creating these things um and that has led into me having legitimate clients that i'm doing like for example snowbike mike his entire yeah. twitch layout um is something that i've been designing and working on oh good well good job um, on that. awesome yeah thank you <laughs> um and there's so many kind of funny you know community members and even people outside of the kind of funny community who've been hitting me up for doing art and layout and design work and um i really have to you know say thank you because you and andy really are like the biggest things like as much as i i put kind of funny as a whole i know i'm talking really fast i'm sorry no, um, uh as kind of funny as a whole like i really um give you guys a lot of credit for where i'm at in life and how i'm doing now um but kfaf in particular was uh came at a time in my life when i was kind of at my lowest creatively and i just got my first paid voice acting gig it was really oh, small nice. but it was still like my first thing um i'm getting emotional sorry um and it's just nice to be able to talk to you and and say thank you to you for kind of sparking that um and bringing me back to you know who i want to be well dude it's my pleasure um and i will say just as a just to paint the opposite picture of that when you're making something that you're not quite sure if it's going to resonate and you see people submit cool stuff really creative fun stuff you have it's you have this feeling like, okay, maybe this is we're like, we're doing something good. And then it's not until you see them resubmit something where you go, okay, we're this is like, you feel like you're actually accomplishing something. And so to all of you guys out there, like everyone on this podcast, who's like submitted ideas, obviously, or Photoshop challenges and to everyone else out there that's listening, that's not a part of this. I can't tell you how incredibly important and moving it is, even to see like when specifically like, like Ben, for instance, like the the joke of it coming back and i'm like oh we're creating something fun like we're resonating with people and 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 now we're enabling other people to make art that's then amplifying our art that is like the most special feeling out there so i want to thank you guys for all of that and also making legitimately um 15 minutes of that 45 minute show super easy for me and andy to do because we got to just go through your guys's submissions and laugh at ourselves and laugh with you and um that's i mean that's i can't tell you how awesome that is so thank you awesome thank you so much for bringing that up phil that's something i yeah. kind of mentioned when tim was here i kind of went over with him a little bit what kind of funny meant to me and the moments in life that kind of funny has been there to kind of help you know bring me back from you know shitty situations or whatever um so yeah N thank you nick for everything you guys do kind of funny. We truly appreciate it all. Well, thank you guys for being out there and actually listening to it and caring. Cause if it wasn't for that, then we wouldn't be able to do any of it. So <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, everyone brings us to the close of the show. Last thing I want to do is just, uh, throw a little shout out out there. Ben, I always forget. It's the OUPod.com. Oh, yes. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say, yeah, kind of in the same vein of Bill, just a huge thank you to you, Nick, and everyone at Kind of Funny. Like, so we wouldn't have met each other at all. We wouldn't be doing this at all if yeah. it wasn't for you. Um, and true. I know this is a highlight of my week. I love doing these podcasts. It's been so much fun. Um, so, yeah, huge, huge thank you to you for everything. This, is, uh, oh. this has been fantastic. And thank you for giving up your weekend. This is crazy that uh, he will be going for a wee while here. So. <laughs> oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you guys for the yeah. invite. I, I appreciate yeah. it. And it's been super fun. Yeah. I've enjoyed talking to you guys and reconnecting with you guys. So it's cool. Yeah. 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 Once we... Um, and, oh, sorry. And yeah, Gage, thank you so much. Yeah, it's the official unofficial New Girl podcast. Episode four is out today. Check it out. The OUPod.com, I believe. Um, that was the episode where Al was cat sitting. One of his cats pooped on the floor. So it's a good one. Um, Great. Good. <laughs> 
um, you can also play a fun drinking game. Every time uh, Al or myself or Erica say the word penis, uh, you'll have a good time. So check that out, theorupod.com and yeah, twitch.tv slash please be excited for some fun upcoming streams. Yeah, Beautiful. Awesome, awesome. Anything anybody else wants to pimp out before we end it? I just want to echo what you guys said. Thank you, Nick, for everything. And thank you, kind of funny, for just, again, sticking by with, with like, entertaining me at a time where I didn't know, what, I didn't have any of that. So it's, it's great. It's, I just want to thank you for that, honestly. It's our pleasure, man. It's good to see you. And I'm, uh, I'm glad that you are, that the moniker of Predator hasn't bitten you in the ass yet. But it will one day. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> it will one day. <laughs> <laughs> the next big job interview, you know? <laughs> yeah. What's this? Uh, why do they keep calling you the predator now? <laughs> it's about some candy. <laughs> these guys are talking about these guys that talk about their dicks a lot. Just uh, <laughs> I give them money. I give them money. <laughs> I'm not gonna get this job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my god. All right. Well, thank you for joining me, Al. Uh, Josh, your first time on. So glad you were able to make it today. Uh, Phil, Ben, who I didn't forget this time. And again, Thanks, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on, Nick. And thank you guys so much for watching out there. If you liked it, hit that subscribe button. Go check out some of the other stuff. We did Tim's episode a couple weeks ago. So if you haven't seen that yet, go check it out. And stay tuned for the next Photoshop challenge, which should be coming up in the next couple days. The theme for this one was Tim Diesel, so you don't want to miss it. All right, Beautiful. everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Beautiful.